Welcome to a sparkling new podcast from Mike Parry and Mike Graham. We're the two Mikes. Actually, it sounds even better when you do it Dullsville, because when you try to be happy and excited and energetic, you sound pathetic. Thanks. Look at the light! Good morning and welcome to the two mics on Extra Time and an extra special good morning to Mr Mike Porky Parry. Very good morning to you, Mr Parry. And a very good morning to you, Mike. And uh, that was a sensational game, wasn't it? Probably yeah. the best game I've seen this season. I think it is, yeah. It I, was, don't, uh, I don't think that's an exaggeration by any stretch no, of the imagination. No, it was super, but it was full of uh, intrigue, mystery and a bit of devilment. Yeah. The Times have gone further than anybody. This mm. morning, the headline on their, on their paper says, Costa likely to face stamping ban. Yeah. So they've taken that right to the ultimate conclusion sure. of him committing horrible um, offences Really, yeah. which could have broken men's ankles mm. or legs, and that because the referee was unsighted, the FA have to get involved. Well, it depends, I suppose, what the referee's report says, right? If the yeah. referee says that he saw it and decided to do nothing, or he just saw it and, and, and yeah. saw part of it, you know, it, it's all very complicated. But I mean, from all days, the TV it? angles we've seen, he certainly didn't see the one against the young lad, not um, what, Chan. Uh, Chan, that's yeah. right. Yeah, he certainly didn't see that. And Daily Mail say Nutter Skirtle Fury as Costa escapes red card for vicious stamp. Right. Skirtle himself, of course, is not a great innocent, but it was. Well, um, he's not. I mean, this is what. I was saying yeah. earlier, I mean, I don't yeah. wish to single out Martin Skirtle for any uh, particular punishment. However, I mean, this is a guy who does more holding, and I'm, I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to back it up with any more, uh, you know, empirical information. I, 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 I need I'm to. not going to back it. Up. But I can't, I can't, you know, I, 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 all I can say is that every time I see Martin Skirtle in a penalty area, yeah. uh, he's holding on to somebody. Yeah, well, every it, single yeah, time. Yeah, I, t- I totally agree with you. Um, I mean, it was 6 1 and half a dozen of the others because, of course, uh, Liverpool should have lost a player for the second yellow card. That yeah. was uh, Henderson. Uh, Henderson, yeah. absolutely. He should have got that because he, the, the handball for which he was penalised and for which a foul was given was easily a yellow card. Put that on top of the one he'd already got, and he should have been off. So, right. so there the, the were folks it was on like, both I mean, sides. for me, it was one of the reasons it was a great game was because it yeah. was like watching one of those old games from the nineties or, or, or even the eighties, where people were sort of tacking lumps out of each yes. other, and it was all part of the, the sport. Really. That's right. Except that the pitch wasn't a mud patch like it used That's to true. be in those days. Yeah. There was one other factor which uh, hit me very, very squarely between the eyes, Mike. A lot of other people have missed this, of course, of but course. I am a trained observer, mm. and that is that Gary Cahill, of course, started mm. the game on the bench. Zuma came on. Mm. Very impressive in the early minutes of the game because he actually cocked something off. He, he did, let the but ball he recovered skip off it, his yeah. head. Well, well, they said he recovered. He only recovered because a fellow defender yeah. got in and tackled. Then he picked up the stray yeah. ball. But nevertheless, nevertheless, it mm. was a recovery of sorts it for was. a young man like that. Yeah. Makes you wonder whether Gary Cahill's days as a regular Chelsea defender mm. are numerando. You know, I, like I don't numbers. think they are. No, I think yeah. what you'll find is that Jose Mourinho will have a plan to put Zuma in uh, one time. Well, he and said then that. Put he said. He said, well, there you are then. He said, he said well, what are you talking about? Well, if Joseph Rinder's already said that, then, yeah. uh, you know, I must be right. No, 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 you mustn't be right. It's interpretation. He said before the game, look, I need a man with speed at the back, and yeah. Zuma is a boy with speed. And that yeah. was proved. Great name for somebody with speed. Isn't uh, yeah, it? Zuma. Zuma. Sounds like he'd be fast. Zuma. <laughs> Zoom, 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 zoom. And, um, and he proved that by picking up pace to recover from that uh, terrible early mistake. Yes. Uh, Gary Cahill, meanwhile, sitting on the sidelines. But I tell you what, Mike, when you're dumped like that so publicly in mm. such a high-profile match, yeah. what a shock to the system. What well, a terrible shock to I the think, system. Well, I think Jose Mourinho's managed to train the players in such well, a way. I mean, notwithstanding the terrible cock-up that happened at the weekend when they went out of the FA Cup, but yeah, I mean, the players that he has yeah. in his first sort of team squad, I think they're all... Uh, I mean, as, as, uh, as Jason was saying on the sports bar, I think they're all... Willing to kind of fight and die for the team. Well, they seem if to you be see, able to do that. You see a young man taking your shirt, you know, not that he took the shirt, of course, because everybody's got an individually numbered shirt, yeah. but this is a problem for Roy Hodgson. Yeah. Because if Roy Hodgson's now got to pick a man who's on the bench at Chelsea... Yeah, that's as, not as, good, as, is it? ...as England's centre-half, that certainly is not a good idea. Um, Costa might be banned, of course, because we just discussed that about the referee. If that happens, mm. if that happens, in my view... Yeah. 50% of the effective firepower that Chelsea have this season yeah, disappears. That's true. Disappears altogether. But what would he be banned from then? What, what, how many games do you think he would get? Well, they can't do it suddenly and quickly. Can they, ban, they ban him from the final of the Capital One Cup, presumably? I doubt that. I, doubt, I, I think it'll be on a number of games from the time that the ban is imposed. Yeah. Now, what I'm saying is... Could it actually happen this week, the rest of this week? Could it be banned for the big one on Saturday night oh, at I don't 4.45? Think make it, I don't think they'll make a decision that I quickly. don't think they will I either. think they don't have the bottle for that. What they'll say is, if they yes. even get around to talking about it before the end of the week, yes. they'll say that Chelsea have until Monday mm. uh, to answer the charge. Yeah, That's I what th- they'll do. No, I think you're absolutely right. But it just shows the Cahill situation in being dropped. just shows how fickle life is at the top. I know yeah. these guys get paid over £100,000 a week, yeah. but the damage to your ego, the damage to your standing mm. in the game, the damage 
damage to your own self-confidence, yeah. the damage to your relationship with your wife and yeah. family, yeah. the damage to your relationship with your friends, the damage Nobody to your relationship... Nobody likes to be sidelined. Nobody likes to be sidelined. No. Now, you know what it's like to be sidelined, don't you? Not really, you? no. You do know what it's like to be sidelined. I was once sidelined at the mm. Daily Express by some horrible features uh, editor woman who uh, 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 I've told uh, you about before, where they diverted my phone calls and I never actually got any phone <laughs> that, calls that's for, terrible. for about five days. Yeah. And I thought, why is yeah. nobody ringing me anymore? Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, these, these things but it, I didn't. I didn't make. I didn't let it uh, last for very long. Yeah. I, I made a dynamic move sideways. Yeah, these things can happen. Yeah. I was in the broadcasting organisation once when I suddenly discovered that the um, breakfast show presenters were walking past my door, even though it said programme director mm. on it, to go and talk to somebody else. And you kind of realise the word is out there. Yes. And uh, you are, you know... Yesterday's news. Yesterday's news, yesterday's man, expendable. Yeah. Um, it first happened to me, or attempted to be happened to me, at the King's School Chester. Did I, it? Ever told you about my uh, football career at the well, King's Well, you told Chester. us yesterday you were a midfield dynamo. Yeah, in midfield fact, we dynamo. got a tweet from somebody yeah, earlier yeah. saying yeah, the only thing that to Paul mm. could a midfield dynamo mm. at is Sabutio. Yeah, well, that's not true. I mean, and you also told us the rather unbelievable story of your sort of uh, Charlie's Angels style cheerleaders. Well, go and watch it. I, I can't help the fact you that I've forgotten I, about I, that already. I, I, that was I, only I, yesterday. No, no, no. I had a, a, a group of groupies who uh, found me, you know, sort of uh, easy on the eye, so to speak. Now, what I'm saying is. So you got dropped from the midfield dynamo? No, 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 no. Uh, you see, I you see, I was so um, pivotal to the team, and yeah. all the boys realised that, including the captain, who was mm. the left fullback. But Mr. Constantinopoulos, that was his name. Constantinopoulos, probably. Constantinopoulos, that was it. Yeah. Constantinopoulos, that was his name. He was our gym teacher, was and he? he was also the first team coach. He made noises about trying to drop me. Did he? He 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 seemed to think that I was ninety nine percent energy, uh-huh. and maybe only you know a minor percentage of. Skill so, and talent. So, so 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration, as some people would have said. Well, that, that, that sounds about right. Well, it was a good, yeah, but that's a good definition of genius as well. No, it's not. Co- it is, according no, you to, to... be you want it to be around the other way, sure. According to... Uh, which, uh, which famous um, industrialist said that? I think it was um, Henry Ford. Was it? I think it was Henry Ford, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah genius is 99% uh, perspiration, 1% inspiration. Mm. Uh, anyway, the point is that uh, that's the way I was. And when the rest of the team heard... They were horrified. Were so they? horrified, they all threatened to go on strike. Really? They wouldn't have uh, my parry drop from the see, midfield. You see, because I've never seen you yeah. as a team, team player at all. Sorry? I've never seen you as a team player. I was, I was a vital cog, utterly vital cog to that midfield. In fact, to the whole team. Mm. I was like a quarterback, really. I Did made the King's happen. School Chester win everything, then, when you played for them? We won lots of things. Did we you? won lots of things, yeah. I presume um, there must be records of all this. Of course. So if Absolutely. I was to look up when you played, what years did you play? Uh, I played in the years about, let me see, what would it be? Presumably uh, it was different, it was separated down by ages uh, as well. Yeah, it would be about um, 70 to 72, something okay. like that. Yeah, right. And, of course, there'll be records, because the records of my school, and we've had this conversation before, go all the way back to Henry VIII. Well, they may well do. You know, Wolf Hall then, and though. all that. Um, I just want but, to look up and see your yeah. name on the school sheet and see your name on the team sheet. I could bring you a picture if you want. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, bring you a picture of my, me yeah. in the... In the you uh, bring that picture of you and Joan Collins yeah. in while you're Well, at uh, uh, no right. problem at all. But, uh, no, the, the, the point is, what, um, what happened tonight was, I think that the whole of the football community was uh, refreshed, yeah. refreshed by the level of competitiveness mm. and... If you're like me, I find it very hard sometimes to enjoy games that don't involve my team. Yeah. You know, there's a sort of distance about well, what you're watching. it's a bit difficult watching. if you look at cup games, isn't it? Yeah, well, of course, it's heartbreaking. They're not in any of them. Heart- heartbreaking, no, that's true. Um, but then when you see a game like that, you think, well, there it is. Now, whether or not, whether or not that will um, mend the damaged and bruised ego which uh, Jose is carrying around with him yeah. because of the result of that shocking game, that shocking forward to defeat against Bradford... Who knows? Mm. It means he can't win the quadruple, but he's now on course for the treble. Yeah, and I again, think, I think he'll be quite happy with that. Uh, we are the two mics. He's Mike Parry. I'm Mike Graham. We've got loads coming up, and of course, uh, it's the Parry Philosophy uh, later on in the show as well. A philosophy feature. I'm looking forward yeah. to that. I'm going to help you out to understand the world, life, universe, and all that's in it. Right. Well, I'm going to help you out by understanding the time because uh, we have to go. This is Talk what? Sport. Look at this music is always played when yeah. we get an update on the uh, uh, the Parry Penthouse of Horrors, as well, I'm calling well, it. And I... uh, in fact, somebody just tweeted out yes. uh, a fantastic thing. Dean uh, has put a, pic- a picture together mm. of Porky's House of Horrors. He says, Porky, I feel your pain with your roof garden wet room and now dishwasher. You yeah. tweeted out earlier yeah. on just before you got in here uh, that now your dishwasher's conked out as well. Well, it's not that it's conked out. It's that I found out information about the dishwasher and I might take it out for health reasons because it's been discovered in a, a new survey that dishwashers are responsible for 
hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions, having back problems oh, yeah. because of the nature of a dishwasher. Most people's dishwashers are on the ground, correct? Yes. They're not at sort of... I have rarely free- seen They're not one... at freezer level, are no, they? No, I've very rarely yeah. seen... And sometimes when you see those very very tiny apartments, you have yes. some ridiculous dishwasher which is up on the top. But yeah. They're yeah. very rare. Mostly speaking, they're the size of a washing machine yeah. or the size of a... Dishwasher. Dishwasher, that's right, yeah, exactly what I was trying to think of. And uh, and they're on the floor, and you, you pull the door down forward, so yeah. you have to go right down almost to the floor, mm. OK? Yeah. And then you're leaning down and actually straining quite a lot to pull out trays full of very heavy crockery and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Right. And, uh, and, and uh, to be perfectly honest, Mike, I don't use it all the time. I fill it up and my housekeeper unloads it, right? That's very kind of you. Yeah, well, well, I fill it up because, of course, I'm using the plates, but I rinse the plates and I put them in and all that, but I, I don't find it that useful because the thing I do use it for, I run it once a week and put all my cups in yeah. because it gets rid of all the tea and coffee stains, right, right? which normal washing doesn't. So where doesn't. do the cups go before you put them in there, then? Uh, uh, well, just accumulate in the sink. You just leave them in the sink? Well, I've got yeah, what an awful situation that no, must be. No, no, That's no. That's horrendous. No, it's not. No, it's By not. the way, this no, tweet you sent out earlier yeah, on, it yeah. says, heading into TalkSport Towers mm, to join mm, old MG mm, on mm, the two-mic mm, show at mm, two. Mm. More problems in the Porky Penthouse yeah. as dishwasher malfunctions. Yeah, well, it malfunctions as an operative... Um, so it hasn't actually broken uh, down? Uh, no, 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 as an operative piece of equipment in uh-huh. the in the kitchen because right. I'm convinced it's going to give me real back problems if I use it any longer. Yeah. So I'm thinking of getting rid of it and throwing it out. But you're a bit closer it's, to the ground than I am, so presumably it would be more dangerous for somebody like me to be leaning down than it would be for you. Yeah, but when you lean down, Mike, the weight of the belly in the front of your body will really strain so the you back and the spine. Well, you've you you just insulted just... me by no, calling me a midget. No, I haven't called you a midget. I've just said the, you're a bit your shorter than I am. The belly in your front of your body will weigh on the spine in the back of your body. In fact, I'm not surprised that when if you open a dishwasher, right, <laughs> and you bend over to try and put something in, your face doesn't go straight into the dishwasher, yeah. smash straight into the right. tray. Well, you well, know what I mean? Your face into a dishwasher. Oh, yeah, yeah, I bet you will, yeah. I'll tell you what, your head. Merely, be, I'm you, merely you, stating a fact. Do you know what you can do with dishwashers? What? You can put um, all sorts of things in them, including... Some people cook things in them. Yeah, well, you can put your keyboard in from your computer. What? You can put your keyboard in. Why would you do that? Uh, clean it thoroughly, because it doesn't get cleaned anywhere else. No, that's an and electronic... By the way, it's a piece of electronic equipment. You can't yeah. get it wet. Did you not learn that from the headphones No, no, you can. You can put your keyboard... I don't think you should there, recommend that. No, there is no electronic stuff in a keyboard. It's just it, it, it's, it's just how do you impulses. Think, how do you think the keyboard connects to the computer? Yeah, but, yeah, but you're not connecting. It. You take the wire out and put the keyboard in. The keyboard on its well, what own. What do you think's in the wire? Yeah, but the keyboard on its own is is just a physical thing. It's like a wind up clock. Right. So there's no electricity so, in it. So the, the the plug that plugs into the keyboard. What yeah. do you think's in that plug? Well, electricity, but right. that doesn't go into the yeah, dishwasher, you fool. But there's electrical, ele- electrical components inside that plug, which lots will of, be damaged by water. Do you know lots of people put their trainers in uh, dishwashers? Uh, they clean I wouldn't their be trainers, surprised about that. Clean yeah. their trainers in a dishwasher, absolutely. I've done some research on the I've dishwasher. I've heard of people cooking fish in a dishwasher. Oh, I've not heard that. Mm. Is that right? Yeah, well, wrap, I know it, that happens wrap it in silver foil. Yeah, yeah, or sprayed water. And you can sort of poach it. Yeah, but there's something else I can tell you, because I did some research on the dishwasher, and I decided I might get rid of it. I wanted to find out where it originated. Now, did you know this? Did you know know that the dishwasher was invented by the same bloke, right, who invented um, the device yeah. to um, shower German soldiers in gas in the trenches in, in the 1914-18 war. Did you know that? I didn't know that, no. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here are. It was... I'll tell you who the guy was. The dishwasher was invented in 1924 by an Englishman... It wasn't by, Bo- it wasn't by Bosch. No. German company. Yeah, but this is an Englishman. All oh, right. Right. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. Bosch. You, yeah, right, I see. Yeah, because they're called Bosch. Yeah. Actually, I think mine's a Bosch. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah, I think it, it is. Though, yeah. yeah. Right. Now then, it was invented in 1924 by an Englishman called William Howard Livens. Mm. L I V E N S. Right. His best known work was creating the Livens projector, right? L I V E N S projector. And that was a device for delivering poison gas into the German trenches during the First World War. It didn't catch on. I mean, not the poison gas. I'm talking about, <laughs> talking about, talking about the dishwasher here, right. right, in 1924. And it wasn't until the 1970s that the use of dishwashers became widespread in Europe and the United States. But now they're more or less ubiquitous and their shortcomings are now... Where are you reading are, are, this from? A, a report I've just been uh, um, had researching. Shortly, shortly before you got no, here. No, 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 I've been researching on dishwashers. I'm told dishwashers no. were invented in the 1850s. No, they weren't. You're talking absolutely No, 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 Mr Livens, who was the gas expert, he, 
he, um, you know, sadly got involved in, in the war and gassing people and all that kind of stuff. But he invented the spray that um, sprayed the gas into the trenches and he utilised that into into the dishwashers. And I agree with him. I agree with him. Dishwashers, what do you mean you agree with him? Uh, I agree with the guy in this report who says that the dishwasher might have had its day yeah. because it can cause more problems than it solves. I mean, loading all the stuff in mm. is one thing. Expecting my housekeeper, you know, who's a good woman, to have to unload it all again, bending down and all that, I think it's an imposition. Well, why don't she you could just actually turn yourself, around then? and sue me. She well, could sue well, me. She could sue you for a lot she of could, reasons. She actually. could sue me by saying that, you know, the, the terrible weight and expectation you put on my spine unloading your dishwasher has caused me crippling arthritis yeah. over the years. Well, what about I mean, all the other stuff you I, 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 What about all the other stuff she has to do? I don't like, you know, cleaning I, the floors on her hands and knees and, and you know, lifting, lifting up the tiles on your roof terrace. I mean, well, all of that. Well, hang on. She's a housekeeper. That's what housekeepers do. No, housekeepers just clean. That's all they do. Well, that's all mostly what she does. Does a few extra they don't get, you know, they don't get phoned in the middle of the night to say, I've lost my keys or I've left them down in Portsmouth. Would you mind coming and letting me into the house at four o'clock in the morning because I haven't got my keys? It's part of her responsibility. No, it's not. And she's very happy no, she to, overly to used oblige for anyway, the wrong reasons. Any, anyway, I'm thinking of getting rid of it. The, um, the first hand powered dishwasher was patented yeah. in 1850 by Joel Houghton. Uh, I'm not talking about hand-powered dishwashers. I'm talking about the electric dishwasher, OK, really? which is the labour-saving one. You can't, you can't call a hand-powered dishwasher a labour-saving device if you're, if you're turning a, a handle on the side of it, almost as if you're trying to start a 1953 mm. Morris Minor. I well, mean, that's, it, uh, that's ridiculous. Say, you might say that it's better than having to, uh, to wash all dishes by no, hand. No, it's not. It's not. Washing dishes by hand is not a problem. It's not a problem at all. In fact... A lot of people will tell you, sometimes people who've got psychological problems, um, you know, go to see psychologists and all that kind of stuff, and they're told that a lot of domestic uh, chores yeah. are very therapeutic. Mm. For instance... I wash my it, own dishes. Uh, w- w- well, I wash my own dishes on a day-to-day basis, you know, except for the cups, because they need but more you than leave, washing. Well, what do you wash them in if the, cup, the sink's full of cups? I've got two sinks. Two sinks? Yeah. So one sink for the dirty cups and one sink for doing the washing. Well, Why don't you just well, wash well, the cups in the other sink while you're at it? Well, because you can't get the tannin. You can't get the tannin. You see, you don't understand. The tannin from tea bags and the tannin from coffee cannot be removed in a simple wash. They need steam cleaning in in a... In a dishwasher. Rubbish. I might keep the dishwasher and turn it into a cupboard for my extensive range of crockery. Um, for instance... What sort of crockery have you got? Well, each Christmas, my mum buys me some more pieces of something called Denby. Have oh, you ever yeah. heard of Denby? I've heard of Denby, yeah. Right, OK, and it's all in blue and white, yeah. which is the colour of my um, apartment. What's right. that, what, how many, what sort of set have you got, then? You've got, like, a 12-set dining... Uh, piece or something like that? What, of Denby? Yeah. I've got nearly 60 pieces now. Well, I mean, how many pe- people could you see? You know how you have to have a side plate, yeah. a main plate, a soup plate, you know, knives and forks? I could easily see eight. Eight people? Yes. When was the last time you had a dinner party for eight people? Um, I've you ne- haven't got seven friends. Well, I admit to that, and, and I'm proud of that. Right. And also... So why have you got all this crockery, uh, uh, then? Uh, well, my mum's bought you it all for me. You should invite me round one night for yeah. a Greek night. We well, can chuck it all in a fireplace. No, you can't do that. It's very expensive stuff. Don't care. My mum likes... My mum buys it for me every Christmas. And mm. it's, it's a great collection, honestly. Yeah, but what's um, the point of having a collection you never use? Well, I, I, I must admit, I have never used it. But that's because I've never had a dinner party. Why don't you just tell her to stop buying you Because I, I, Well, because she likes buying it for me. She likes it. It's a great collection. And I wouldn't have a dinner party because mm. I don't want people in my house talking garbage. <laughs> um, right? No, I don't. And, um, you know, I'm basically disrupting the ambience of my home. Right. I, I, I don't like dinner parties. Yeah, because the ambience of your home is so fantastic now. You've yeah. got, you know, uh, all sorts of things going well, on. You've uh, got the wet room, which is a complete wreck. It is a You've disaster. got a sink full disaster. of cups. You've disaster. got a roof terrace that looks like something uh, out of but downtown Baghdad, as you said. Yeah, Dash right. has sent this yeah. in, actually, to the yeah, two yeah. mic, saying, well, I feel sorry yeah. for people who live yeah. underneath yeah. Mr Parry. Every day mm. must feel like a scene from the Poseidon adventure. Well, that's a bit cruel. But, I mean, you know, it's it's called maintaining your property and keeping an eye on things. Yeah, but you're not, though. You make it worse. No, no. It's It's turned into a complete shambles. I've tried to explain to you the broken window theory before. If you let a broken window go by... You get a second broken window, yeah. and then you get dilapidation. Yeah, yeah you've told me about it. And I'm this. not having dilapidation. Yeah, but you are um, responsible for all right, the, the you dilapidation tell me about, of the block. Tell, OK, go on then. Go on, cultural, you know, icon. Thank you. Tell me about the, the dinner party, the great dinner parties you've thrown Oh, in I've thrown loads time. of great dinner parties. Oh, rubbish. I don't do so much well, you never now. invited me to one. No, I never have, no. no. You, we had That's one because once I don't in, want it ruined. We had one once in New York, mm. and we ended up on the roof throwing eggs at people. No, I don't remember that. What? No, it wasn't a dinner party. 
Well, it was, it was some reason we were around there eating Yeah, you'd probably dinner. just come up for a drink or something Maybe like that. something like that. No I've, never, um, no, I've never invited you around for dinner because I know that you're not particularly a, a foodie sort of person. You're well, not I'm, interested I'm, in food. No, it's not that I'm a, not a foodie person. I'm not a company person. Mm. I can't tolerate... You don't get on with people. I can't tolerate... I couldn't possibly put you into a mix of, say, six or seven other couples... I cannot... Uh, ..and allow you to be let loose on them. It would be well, a nightmare. Well, I cannot tolerate the illiterate ramblings of a bunch of dopes uh-huh. uh, sat around a table right. thinking that they're the elite of society who, well, who, who are no, you, who are no nothing about the elite of society who are no are nothing getting, has getting, been never will be getting, I don't like mixing with people like that you don't like mixing with anyone yeah. but I'll tell you about well, the that, elitist that's true to a certain extent. the elitist snobbery factor has mm. gone massively uh, downhill in your direction because I don't think after so. what you said last night about private schools and about first class travel people have decided you are no longer the man of the people in fact I am the man of the people and we'll talk some more the about that the greatest meritocracy up next. look into the light greatest meritocracy in this country that has ever been or grammar schools and direct grand grammar schools give children from poor Stop homes talking. whose fathers are bus drivers the chance of a great education. Yeah, that's not what you said last night. Very, very inconsistent, I'm afraid. This is Talk Sport. We are the... Ever since you and I have been working more together, mm. part of my brain, I'm sure, has been uh, affected in some way, and my memory cells have started to desert me. Well... Because I used to know who was in bread. Funny, funny you should say that. And I think you're having some kind of deleterious effect on me. No, I don't think I am, but during the course of these next two hours, and if not tonight, then another time, mm. I've got, uh, no joke... I've got a load of um, of clues as to how to retain your memory. In fact, I've got one very good one I'm going to tell you about. I was going to tell you about it later on in the show anyway. I put out, I put out a story actually on Twitter yeah. earlier tonight about a new gene that they've discovered yes. that can actually be the one that determines whether or not you have uh, the ability to, okay. to, to remain compass mentors in old age. Now, don't you remember, in the show last night, I said to you, what you should do if you want to remember things is chew chewing gum as you're trying to remember, yeah. right? So you study facts, you... You look at a documentary, you read a book or something like that. If you want to remember all that's there, chew chewing gum very rapidly. Yeah. And what happens is the motion of your teeth going like this, and you're chew chewing like that, it sends um, uh, messages to your brain, literally. You you're know. talking about chewing gum? Yeah, I'm chewing, I'm chewing gum. You talked about this last night. I, I know, but I'm, I'm, I'm well, expanding on it. Why are you saying this again? Because I'm you saying... You've forgotten that you talked about it last night. No, no, no. I'm chewing gum. All the information goes in your brain yeah. and stays there because the information parks itself on the basis it was said yeah, there this by night. the chewing motion. Yeah, but I found, yeah, I found except, another... Except the one bit of information that yeah, you've forgotten yeah. is that you've already told us. David Gates no, no. was in uh, bread. David Gates, right. Yeah. So who were the um, who were the uh, brother and sister who sang, you know, um, So Goodbye, My Love? That hey? was... Um, the Carpenters. Oh, it was Carpenters, yeah. Sounds the same, Karen isn't it? Carpenter. Yeah, that's right. She Absolutely. died of anorexia. Yeah, poor woman. Now, listen, talking about anorexia, which we shouldn't talk about because it's a terrible disease and I'm, I have great sympathy for people who've got it. Um, and we've just been talking about... No, we were talking about anorexia. No, we're not. We've been talking about domesticity, right, and kitchens and all that. Domesticity. Do you know that the, uh, the, che- uh, the um, sandwich toast is on the way back? Is it? Only this time, this time, pal, you ain't going to get away with buying one for £10.99 mm. in Woolworths, which is where I got my first uh, sandwich toaster, OK? Really? Woolworths, of course, closed down now. It doesn't exist anymore. And what are you a sandwich toaster from Woolworths? Yeah. That's not a very good I did idea. for £10.99, yeah. The first flat I ever bought was in... Um, in uh, Palmer's Green in North yeah. London, there was a Woolworths in Palmer's Green High Street. So yeah. I went in and bought a toaster because, uh, you know, everybody had one. Everybody had a soda stream. Well, screen. everybody buys one, but you actually use it about four times and then you just put it in the I cupboard. think I used it twice. And do you yeah. know what I did? I put beans in it. So you, what you get is you get, uh, you get two slices of bread, which you have to butter on both sides. Yeah. You know that, don't you? What? You have to butter the bread on both sides. What, when you put it in a sandwich maker? Yes. Well, you can do. You don't have to. No, you have to. Well, otherwise, you otherwise, it sticks to the... The inside of the sandwich toaster, mm. so you need to grease the butter. Yeah. Uh, sorry, you need to grease the bread on both sides. Yeah. And then what I used to do was, I would put a tin of beans in the middle, right? And then um, beans on toast in a sandwich maker. Yes, that's right. Yes. Sandwich toaster. And, and then press it down that and lock a bit it. Dangerous. No, so press it down, lock it, and all that, and then it come out as two sandwiches because there was a cutter in the middle, right? Yeah. But then eating it, it was so hot. I mean, it, no, no, it burnt my tongue and mouth and everything. So well, you're, I, supposed, I, you're supposed to make, like, cheese and, and ham and Well, like here that. are the new ones. Right, now, that one costs £10.99. They make £10. tomatoes £10. very hot as well, actually. Now, do you know what the new one costs? No. £200. Who makes that, then? It's called a Julep Contact Toaster. Oh, it's uh, sorry, it's £239. State-of-the-art toaster makes a sandwich in one minute. Uh, you can control the temperature on it. Suggested menus for this one. Yeah. Suggested menus. Yeah, this will this will suit your fantastical mind because I don't believe in all this uh, garbage that you tell me about buying organic food at mm. Borough Market. 
What you put in it is pesto, avocado, spinach and brie, yeah. goudan, pan-fried wild mushrooms and thyme, crunchy peanut thyme. butter. Thyme. Where thyme. would you get that, then? Eh? From the supermarket. <laughs> I think that's funny. <laughs> it's thyme, it's not thyme. Uh, have you been to Strawberry Fair? Parsley, sage, yeah. rosemary and thyme. <laughs> What are you, what are you laughing it's at? not thyme. It is thyme. It's time, you it's idiot. Not, it's not. Time is T I M E. It's time is on your, your wristwatch here, you know, mm. on your Rolex. Yeah. It's not, it's not on. How do you pronounce not... Thibaut Courtois? What? How do you pronounce Thibaut Courtois? I don't know, don't care. It I'm telling you. With about, a TH. I'm telling you what you put into uh, the uh, the modern uh, uh, sandwich toaster, right? Yeah. Crunchy peanut butter. You don't butter. even know what half of those things are. Hang on, just listen. Uh, crunchy peanut butter, Nutella mini marshmallows. Nutella. Or is that there was well, Nutella that's an old difference? Teller. No, hang, hang on. Is Nutella different to many marshmallows? I suppose yeah, very it is. different. Yeah, yeah. okay. It's, it's so, a spread, and it's pronounced okay. Nutella. Right, you can, it's made of nuts. You can put Nutella like in mini marshmallows. The other things you can put in: sliced figs, pecans, goat's cheese, and sage. Mm. Okay, mm. Um, and you can also, if you want to go back to basics with a cheese and ham toasty, yeah. you now use a raclette and a bayon in between slices of brioche. Okay, brioche. Yeah, yeah, brioche or whatever. Yeah. Um, what are you laughing at? Why are you always laughing? Why are you laughing? Because you don't anyway, even know how to pronounce some of this anyway, stuff. Anyway, anyway, brioche. The point is, this is the the sandwich toaster is now being endorsed by some of the world's top chefs. I'm sure it who is. Who say it is uh, fantastic? Yeah, there's another well, one. You'd here. have to be mad to spend 250 yeah, notes yeah. on a sandwich to- maker, wouldn't you? Yeah, there's another one here, which is a uh, which is a recipe for a toaster, and it's what you you get is recipe for a toaster. Mini cheese and gherkin toasty. Mm. Right, which are now bar snacks in top um, uh, bars, yeah. cocktail bars. Also, you can have ox cheek and grayer. Um, <laughs> why, why are you laughing? Grayer, yeah. Grayer. Okay. Uh, grayer. Topped with a fried egg and chilli sauce. And That sounds horrible. And duck and waffle. You'd um, like that, wouldn't you, duck and waffle? Well, I don't know. But... Uh, Oh, I tell you what. There's even a yeah. There's one here. Uh, the world's hottest toasted sandwich is the cinnamon uh, Soho. Uh, well, and, that'd be good for you after that cinnamon challenge. And that's uh, spiced crab or minced lamb and scrambled egg variety. So I mean, it's all you know. It's all becoming very, very. It's all gone very high tech, but I mean, hasn't it? But I mean, I still wouldn't use a toaster. Do you have know you why? Still got one at home then. No, of course not. If, not? I, if I have it so far back in the cupboard, I can't find it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it might be in one of the I mean, cupboards up I in the kitchen admit, somewhere. On the occasion mm. when you kind of mm. break it out and dust yeah. it down yeah. and you make a toasty, it, it is actually quite nice. I wouldn't even know how to use it these days, seriously. Well, it hasn't wouldn't, changed. Wouldn't know how to use it. No, but I mean... Well, you wouldn't. I mean, what you shouldn't do is put mm. beans in it. That's oh, no, a really no, bad I, idea. I like the beans. But what I'm saying is... Didn't well, they sweep out of the edges? No, 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 they didn't, honestly. The, it sealed the bread as like a, you know, like a sealed mm. package, if you right. see what I mean. And even put a divider down the middle, so you've got two sandwiches, you know, two bean right. sandwiches. I might put sausages in it as well as the beans, you know what I mean? Like beans and sausage. Yeah. But the point I was going to make is, you know sometimes when you go into a boozer, you know, like a pub? A pub? Uh, yeah. And, um, well, no, I don't uh, go uh, into one as often as you do. Well, that's irrelevant. I mean, you know. Well, no, so I'm not as familiar with the modern day pub as you are. But sometimes we're going to pubs together, okay? We do, yeah. Now, sometimes if you're on. Yeah, we're going to Crystal Palace this weekend. We're going to Crystal Palace on Saturday, yeah. There'll be a couple of pubs involved in that. Yeah, need to talk to you about that, obviously. Best behaviour, please, down at the Palace with Mr. Palson, (laughs) our. uh, That's pretty good coming from you. Our host. Anyway, anyway, you go in and you get a. You know, you say quick pint and all that kind of stuff, and you think, well, just have a quick snack, and you say, what you got? Oh, a range of pies. Mm. And one of the pies might be the old chicken and ham or something yeah. like that. So you say, oh, have a pie. Now, that pie then suddenly appears on your table in three minutes. Yeah. It's clearly been in a microwave. Yeah. Now, in my view, there's something very, very dodgy about microwave food. Well, you don't very expect dodgy. them to make the pie from scratch, do you? No, I don't, of course, I don't. But I expect they would have some pies on a hot plate somewhere, mm. warming up for the customers who come in, and they estimate the number of pies they're going to sell each day. Yeah. But to have one that comes out of a microwave, mm. the minute you cut into it, I mean, I'm not joking. The steam comes out A of ball it. of steam hits you in the <laughs> face. And my glasses got steamed up on this occasion. Yeah, I remember it once. Yeah. I cut into it and whoosh, you know, I nearly got, like, burns on my skin. And, well, and you shouldn't have your head down glasses, by the pie. Glasses uh, got all misted up. And, and I thought, this is, 
this is too evil to eat mm. because it's been bombarded by, like, uh, what do you call it? Um, you know, what, what's inside a microwave? Right, inside a microwave, yeah, the know, energy beams. No, not energy beams, like... Um, Radiation. What, no, what makes up uh, energy? What makes up uh, a neutron? Jewels. No, no, no. You know, molecules, like, like you know, uh, fast-moving molecules, yeah. which, um, which bombard the pie mm. and make it so hot. It's unnaturally hot, and I don't think any food should be served well, that hot. why don't hot. you ask them to warm it up in a way which is... Electrodes, electrons, electrons. Electrodes. It's, no, if it's electrons. Your electrodes are you part no, of trouble. Yeah, you are. It's it's electrons um, which uh, go whizzing around inside the um, inside the microwave. Well, you just have a bag of crisps. Uh, uh, like you know, millions of miles an hour, for want of a better word. Mm. Well, uh, actually, I, I don't like crisps. I do like peanuts, but I find that these days, the normal ordinary packet of peanuts is going right out the window, Mike. And you know what? They've got all these silly little jars behind the bar with, oh, mix and match, you know, yeah. roasted peanuts. And, and even one from... Um, you shouldn't eat ones which are not in a packet, actually. There were some peanuts from China in a pub I went into a couple really? of days ago. Yeah. Chinese peanuts. Wasabi. What's wasabi? Wasabi. Wasabi. Yeah, Japanese. Japanese, yeah, yeah, from Japan. Peanuts from Japan, but called wasabi peanuts. Wasabi peas, yeah. 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 Normally it's wasabi peas, well, yeah. Blimey, I couldn't it's, eat that. It's quite a, quite a delicate yeah. taste. Anyway, yeah. uh, that's enough of that nonsense. Loads more what to come. Nonsense? And uh, we've got Paris philosophy coming up very shortly. Let me just leave you with this mm. uh, from uh, Paul, who says, uh, Porky, you're a bit of a snob on the quiet. Let's pronounce one word mm. over eight hours of broadcasting with you during yeah. a week. right. Why do you have to highlight it? Are you that envious nothing of my command of the English language? It's nothing to do with me. Are you that envious? It's, hmm? got, it's got nothing to you do with me. You feel that the only way that you can get a high out of this show is to put the old poor master down? Is that like, yeah. hey? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, listen, um, one of the things that yeah. we do very regularly on this show is we talk a little bit about space. Definitely. Uh, and about Saturn and the yep. latest developments in Excellent. the world of science, of I like course. That. And we're going to talk now to Dr Ian O'Neill, uh, who's a scientist and journalist for a range of publications, including Discovery News and Al Jazeera as well. Right. Uh, because you might remember, um, apparently, ast uh, astronomers this week were saying that they've discovered a new planet um, with a gigantic ring system, which is 200 times larger than that around Saturn. Wow. Uh, and we want to ask him about those uh, pictures from Mars as well. Definitely. Uh, Dr O'Neill, a very good morning to you. Welcome. Hi there. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, thanks indeed Hi, for, Dr. Uh, for joining Dr. us. Dr O'Neill, great to be on the show again. Thank you. What, for you or for him? <laughs> no, no, great to have the doc on the show. Yeah, the doc's mm. turned back, yeah. Mm. Now, what do you make of this new planet? 200 times larger than, uh, uh, than the rings around Saturn. That sounds massive. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's, it was actually discovered back in 2012, but um, I think uh, new research has been published just saying that just how big these rings are and the fact that these rings could actually be creating little moons called exomoons around this planet, it's, um, it's a big one. It's a big discovery. What, is, what are these uh, rings made of, Doc, in the sense that are they real? Are they, are they gas or...? They're real, yeah. They are real. Yeah, well, They're not yeah, imaginary. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, could you let the expert answer the question? <laughs> They're not imaginary so, rings. So, sorry, Doc, ignore um, the chap on my left here. If you could just uh, He doesn't answer, know I'm on your left. Just answer that question, please. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, basically, uh, the, as far as astronomers know, it's going to be ice and uh, rock. So basically it's ground-up rock. Mm. And this is like the, the stuff that forms, um, forms moons around this planet. So you can imagine this is a, a young world. I mean, it's a lot bigger than Jupiter or even or Saturn. And as you say, the rings are a lot more vast than, mm. than Saturn's ring. They would completely dwarf uh, Saturn if you put it side by side. And, yeah, they're basically just made of the stuff that builds moons. And it's really interesting to look at this system because the, the rings are so big that it actually blocks the light from the star. So that was how it actually got discovered in the first place and mm. how they were able to discover it, how they were able to study it in depth. And now they're hoping to delve even further into the details of, uh, of the signal they've received and hopefully detect these exomoons that are actually carving out these paths in between the, in between the rings. So, quite seriously, Doctor, to put this into layman's language, these things are like donuts floating around in space, are they? Well, I suppose it does look like a donut from afar, but it's a bit more like a disc, you know. Right, so, a disc, so yeah. Look yeah. On the side. So yeah. If you look on the side, it'd be flat, but from the top, absolutely, you have these huge, like, donut discs. Yeah. yeah. 
and, and they're all connected what, together. What's that got to do with anything? Uh, well, what it's got to do with anything, Mike, is I'm trying to get a, a, an image in my head of how all this could have started and could they have been formed from... Donuts. Uh, no, 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 don't be silly. Could they have been formed from some centrifugal force that might have whipped the atmosphere around in the same way that a human being does a hula hula hoop, you see what I mean? And then... Uh, then, then uh, uh, sorry? Yeah, you touched on an interesting point. Because there is also the theory that if we look at Saturn, mm. uh, Saturn's rings, that the tides of, um, of Saturn, because it's such a, it's a huge body, a huge mass, it yeah. produces these really, really strong tides. So, it, so in the orbit of Saturn, uh, that you can't really have moons forming at a certain distance because they literally get ripped to shreds. Mm. So it's almost like going into a tidal blender. So there is going to be a point with this massive exoplanet that's been discovered with this huge ring system mm. that's going to have a massive uh, gravitational and, and tidal pull over the moons that are going to be forming inside this huge disk. But it mm. may well rip them to shreds. So, mm. yeah, it's almost like a demolition derby inside this, inside this massive ring system. And where is, it, where is this planet? It's called J1407b, mm -hmm. uh, which I always think is a yeah. very unromantic kind of name when yeah. they give them these kind of numbers yeah, and letters. Name, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's not a good name. But where, where is it? it? Where is it, it exactly? Um, I, I believe it's uh, about uh, a, a few dozen light years away, I think. It was actually spotted, um, I believe, by the, by the Kepler um, Space Telescope, All which right. actually looked for this dimming in light as, the, um, as um, planets pass in front of the star. But this one, it, as I say, was pretty um, pretty extreme because the huge ring system actually blocked out you know, like 95% of the light from the star. So it was like a big obvious sign that was something in the way, and it just happened to be this massive ring system. It's, it's so amazing. It's, it's quite a distance away, but it's it's really interesting for astronomers to study. Uh, 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 now, can we ask you about something else, Dr. O'Neill? Hang, hang on, uh, shouldn't we call them Polo? Hey? Shouldn't you call it Polo? What? The, the planet. Cause you, you call know, it Polo? Yeah, call yeah, it Polo. Polo. Why? Well, because it looks like a packet of polos. I mean, you just said that numbering a planet as a number is not right. very um, romantic. Well, it's not very romantic calling it after a sweet. Oh, hang on, it? the doctor's just said, Doc has just said, yeah, let's call it polo. So we've just named it polo. You might have an argument from go. Ralph Lauren on that one. You yeah. might have the copyright Hey, and, and you may well be able to uh, actually put that forward as a suggested name because the International Astronomical Union, the, the worldwide body for naming exoplanets, um, is actually calling for names for a selection of planets. I don't know if this is one of those planets, but in the future, you may well be able to call it Polo. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very maybe, much. Maybe After the could... Polo Mint, you fool, and not the Polo Fashion yeah. Um, uh, brand. Yeah, all right. Sorry, I'm not calling you, you a fool, I... Doc. I'm talking to my uh, Yeah, do we call him that. Now, do you mind if I ask him a, a, a more Please intelligent do. question? Please do. What do you make of these pictures from uh, the Mars rover? Because lots of people have been on uh, uh, Twitter and various other mm. forms of social media speculating on what they think they've seen. Um, from rats to skulls to bizarrely a disappearing donut in these uh, these kind of shadowy oh, pictures from Mars. Yeah. The donut, yeah, I love that. I love that story. Yeah, so basically, uh, this is a wonderful mix of um, amazing imagery coming from the surface of Mars. I mean, who would have thought we'd have a high definition camera on the surface of Mars taking these incredible pictures of Mars rocks? I mean, that is incredible in its, in its own right. But then you're looking at another part of science, which is to do with the human brain mm. and how we have a tendency to see familiar objects in very random shapes. And we've kind of evolved this way. Apparently, this was something when we were back in the Stone Ages, when we were, you know, um, tr trying to survive out in our, as cavemen. We needed to recognize familiar objects or familiar faces. And it was like this evolutionary advantage that we probably had. That's one of the theories. But now we've got high technology on the surface of Mars, taking pictures of Mars rocks. Our brains, our old caveman brain, is looking at these objects and saying, I see a face. Oh, no, actually, no, I see a rat. No, actually, that kind of looks like, uh, you know, uh, my, my, my mother's pet mm. rabbit. Who knows? So we, we, we're, we're, we're coming up with these familiar shapes and very random rocks. And recently there was a picture that the uh, Mars rover Curiosity took, and there's a shadow, and it looks like there's somebody kind of hunched over the rover, their shadow. But that's actually just part of the instrumentation on the back of the rover. Mm. It just so happens it looks like a person. I mean, it, it doesn't mean there's an alien there. It doesn't mean there's a person there. Mm. It just means we are very creative 
Um, yeah, and we want and we want to see something literally that isn't but, there. Um, yeah. Doctor O'Neill, as ever, a great Thanks, pleasure Doc. to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed, Doctor Ian like, O'Neill. Um, there, uh, who's a scientist. It's like walking through a forest at night, mm. right? And you start yeah. hallucinating. Well, you don't start hallucinating. You start seeing shapes and shadows, mm. which are really just trees waving at you and that kind of stuff. In waving the wind. at you. Well, trees do wave at you. Trees no, they don't. Wave. They blow in the wind. No, no, no. They wave at you. Trees wave at you. When was the last you time you walked in a forest in the middle of the night? Um, I when you was to do the that. last time I did that? I'm not sure really, but I mean, we've all done it, haven't we? But where, in the old penthouse in Surrey, Mike, when I sit there and I'm watching telly, when it comes to spring, and then spring starts moving towards summer, and the trees then start filling up with leaves, mm. right, you can tell the trees are waving at you, because they, they, they are, they are, I'm telling you. There is a direct relationship in the world between trees and man. There has to be. Well, the trees are living organisms. That's what I'm saying. Of course they are. Said. Of course uh, they are. And people don't give right. enough credence to the, the living organism part of a tree. I mean, 95% of this country used to be covered in trees. In Robin Hood's day, the reason he lived in a forest was because everybody lived in a forest. Yeah. The only people who didn't live in forests were people who could afford to bring slaves along, cut down loads of trees and build a castle. Well, wasn't Henry VIII responsible for cutting down a lot of trees? He, he was, because he built a lot of ships, because yeah. he was the father of the Royal Navy. That's right. So he started um, uh, cutting a lot down. But what I'm saying is, the only... the, well, only... the whole of Britain was once covered by trees, wasn't it? That's what I'm saying. And, the, you know, the road from, like, the Chaucer Tales... I've just read a new book about the Chaucer Tales. Fascinating. You mean fascinating. The Canterbury Tales? Canterbury Tales, yeah, yeah involving Geoffrey Chaucer. Involving, yeah he, yeah, was, yeah, he was the writer. Yeah, exactly, that's right, absolutely. And, um, you know, the old road from London down to Canterbury, yeah. you know, for the... I mean, everybody thinks... Well, you mean that, it wasn't the A2 then? Well, I was going to say, everybody thinks it's the equivalent of the M2 today. Yeah. It wasn't. It was a path through a forest. Yeah. That's all it was. Sure. That's all it was, you well, know. Like had a Shrek, in other words. Hey. Shrek. You've seen Shrek, haven't you? No. You've never seen Shrek? No, I have no. Have you never seen Shrek? I don't know. I don't like it. Why don't you like it? Uh, it's a great film. Uh, I, I don't know. It looks weird to me. Why looks does bit, it look weird? Well, you know, this kind of monster type character and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> no, no, I don't know what you're laughing at. You know. It's a cartoon. Yeah, I'm not keen on it. He's but, an ogre. But what I'm saying is, you've got to remember, to make the road any wider than three or four feet, you yeah. have to cut another tree down. Sure. Now, the pilgrims aren't interested in cutting trees down, they're only interested in getting ca- to Canterbury. Yeah. And so the well worn path literally snaked between trees yeah. and all this kind of stuff. And right. there'd be a clear. Well, it wasn't that easy to cut down trees uh, in those days, no, either. It was very difficult. Uh, they didn't even, didn't even have hey, I'll tell you what, by the way, one yeah. of the things that I've got yeah. very good at right. is splitting wood with an axe. Do you remember I told you I bought an axe yes. uh, months and months ago? Yes. I've now, because one of the things is when I buy uh, wood for my, for my uh, wood fire. Wood burning fire. For the wood burning fire. Which pollutes fire, the. Uh, does not pollute anything. Pollutes the atmosphere worse than coal. Well, what wood does? Yes, rubbish. wood does. Absolutely wood rubbish. does. Wood, anyway, wood pollutes is, the atmosphere worse than coal. Rubbish. Anyway, it does. I can tell you. finish the story. I know these things. Please do. Anyway, the point is some of the pieces of wood come and they're a little bit too big to fit in once you put the grate back yeah, in and everything like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, so I've worked out that you can just split the wood mm. in one move. I can do it in one move now and it's fantastic. You with know, one I, hand? Uh, no, I use two hands with right. the axe. Okay. But, uh, but it splits it perfectly and suddenly I now know, because I, I had loads of this wood that was too big yeah. to go in yeah. and now I don't have to buy any more because I've now got loads of it having it's split good, it all up. Good idea. I do just li- thought I'd tell you about yet another talent I've and, discovered and, about and myself. And do you leave it outside? Uh, no, I'll keep it in the shed. I was going to say, you leave it outside, it gets wet, yeah. you then put it in your wood burner. No, you don't it, want to do that. It, it then lets off terrible belching smoke. Mm. And, uh, no, you don't want to do that. And uh, completely defeats the purpose yeah. of doing it. So you're absolutely right. Now, a couple of things to mention to you. Uh, Sharky has sent in a picture, very helpfully, Sharky, uh, good. Of, a, of a new type of dishwasher, he says. Uh, right. Try one of these two drawer dishwashers. There's no reaching down and it washes two loads at once. Even if it's a two-drawer one, it's yeah. got an upper drawer and a lower drawer. Well, I still think got to somehow... reach down to put stuff in the lower drawer. No, I don't think so. I think somehow it's interchangeable. I think you just put the stuff in the top and it kind of settles its, its way down to the bottom. What? I don't think you need Sounds to bend down at all. To me. And here's one from Sounds somebody too expensive. Uh, who uh, uh, I'm sure has been looking up the wrong place. Right. He says, hi, two mics. I've just looked it up. And you can put a keyboard in a dishwasher Thank as you. long as you take the batteries out. This is from Luke in Colville. Thank you. Um, uh, in Leicestershire. There this you is go. The show. Keep up there the you go. Work. You see, more that and doesn't more, make Mike, any sense to me. More at all. and more, you know, you have to concede on these things when you realise that you've tried to shoot me down in flames because of your ignorance, not mine. But you're pretending that I am uh, a know nothing nerd when, in fact, when in fact, it's you, it's you who doesn't have the benefit of my extensive knowledge, and you don't like that. It's no, obvious. I don't. No, it's, it's very true. So you uh, try and mock me. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. The, the let, let me tell you this: the listeners are much brighter than you, pal. Yeah. And every time you try to mock me on a falsehood, they'll get you. 
Porky has revealed himself to be a snob. Uh, he's now not the man of the people. I'm not a says snob. Paul. I'm not a snob. I, and, want, uh, I want meritocracy. I want bus drivers' sons to go to grammar schools so that they can go to university and the second generation of the family suddenly becomes magnificently yeah, but you also you know, want first class more passengers. advanced than the first generation of the family. Want, you also want first-class passengers to be allowed to land at airports before everybody else. Well, that's natural. No, that is natural. Of course it is. That's a snobbish attitude. It's not, because the people on board are more important to the, the world. Time, by the way. You've seen the time. Of course I see the time. I see the time all the time. Well, the trouble you is, you're, you're a slave to the clock, mate. Yeah. I'm not. I am a slave to the clock, uh, as is uh, the commercial radio station for which we are employed. The two mics, he's Mike Parry, I'm Mike Graham. There will be a podcast coming out a little bit later on. And I want to start this hour with some advice for you from Dr Carl Apolkalainen, yeah. uh, who is a former uh, World Health Organisation alcohol expert. Right. And he's just released a study, which will be great news for you. He says you can actually drink six pints of beer a day. Well, he's mad. And it's OK for your health. Well, he's mad. He's, he's not off his mad. Rocker. He says drinking only becomes harmful when people consume more than around 13 units a day. But well, according to the new, uh, the new sort of government guidelines, yeah. you're not supposed to have more than four units a day. Uh, I think the government guidelines say maximum of something like 21 units a week yeah. for the adult male. Right. Which is a pint and a half a day. Yeah. Well, 21 units a day is what this guy says is OK. And that's, uh, what's that, six pints? Six pints, apparently, yeah. Six, three's 18. So... I thought a pint was only two units. Uh, I think it's probably a bit more because a small glass of wine is one unit, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's probably about two and a half units or something like that. Well, I'm sorry, but that goes against all known medical science that we've been taught since the age of five, doesn't Mm. it? It really does. Well, it does, but, I mean, this guy's from Finland and he's an expert on these things. Well, they don't drink in Finland, do they? Yeah, they do. No, they don't. It's too expensive. They drink to excess in Finland. No, they drink... They they produce a lot of vodka in Finland. Mm. What's it called? Finlandia or something, isn't Uh, it? You can get Finlandia, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, And maybe he's confusing it with that. But anybody who drinks six pints of beer a day, every day... Will die. Well, what he says is this, right? The weight of the evidence shows that moderate drinking is better than abstaining, and heavy drinking is worse than abstaining. However, the moderate amounts can be higher than the guidelines say. Well, is six pints a day moderate drinking? Uh, well, he would say so, yeah. Well, I wouldn't. I I'd wouldn't t- say six pints every single day. Is I, I, I'd say you're on the road to cirrhosis of the liver if you drink six pints of beer a day. He also says you can drink just over a bottle of wine a day and you'll be fine as well. And you might actually live longer than a teetotaler. It's great news for you. Why is that? Uh, what's he based that on? Well, he doesn't. It doesn't. Where'd you get this crazy? St- I mean, this, this man report. must have been intoxicated when he wrote this no, report. No, this is a report that he it just brought out. It was mad. Yeah. Man, maybe maybe the guy who wrote it has a you know a, a preference for alcohol and wants to try and justify his consumption of it by producing a worldwide report saying it's all okay. Well, predictably, uh, somebody from think tank goes two- in the face of everything we've ever been told about alcohol. Twenty Twenty Health, a woman called Julia Manning said, "This yeah. is an unhelpful contribution to the debate. It makes grand claims which we don't see evidence for. Alcohol is a toxin. The risks outweigh the benefits." I mean, there's no doubt about it. Look, um, we've been heavy social drinkers for the last thirty years, mm. right? Probably. Maybe a bit longer. Probably longer, actually. Actually, much longer. I started drinking socially when <laughs> I... Socially? What, what, are you, what are you laughing at? You started getting bladdered. Why don't you start the sentence with that? Excuse me. When's the first time you got drunk? I've told you this before. At a wedding when I was 12, and oh, I right. had a, two baby shams. Yeah, OK. And ended up literally under the table. Mm. Um, but I started going out with my mates drinking mm. when I was about 15. Yeah. And the thrill you of didn't walking... You beard then, did you? No, of course not. Well, you might have had, because that would have made it easy for you to get into pubs. No, no. The thrill of walking into a pub and walking up and saying, you know, pint of lager and lime, please. Yeah. And then they look at you, and then, you know, the barmaid says, and she has it open her mouth, you're going to say, I'm sorry, you're not old enough. No. She says, which which sort of lager would you like? Mm. And you're so nervous and unprepared for being inside a pub, which seemed like, you know, a mystery world to uh, people of 15 in those days because sure. they were full of billiards tables mm. and smoke and all this kind of stuff. And, and the I'd, occasional pinball machine. Yeah, the occasional pinball machine. And you didn't know the names of the lagers, yeah. you know. And then so you looked up and down the, and I said, uh, Grunhaller, please, because it was Green Grunhaller? Or, yeah, Grunhaller. Green or Whitley was the local um, brewery around the northwest, oh, right? Yeah. And they produced a, a log called Grunhalle, which I thought for years was must have been produced in the Grunhalle forest in Germany. <laughs> but I didn't realise. Well, luckily you didn't mispronounce it. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't realise that it was you know a very uh, amateurish play on the word Greenall, as in Greenall Whitley, which yeah. was made in Warrington. <laughs> but um, like that vodka, the vodka we make in Warrington. Yeah. Um, but anyway, look, look. The point of the story is what is the point of the story? You've uh, you've been taught ever since that day that you know it's not good for you and. Uh, and I just, I've read a, I've read a report, Mike, which is completely challenging to what you've just told me this mm. week. That says 
if you're a moderate drinker, so maybe you have three pints a day. Okay. Three pints a day is still quite a lot if you're doing it every day. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Obviously, I don't drink really during yeah. the week at all. Or, or a couple of pint, a couple of glasses of wine, right? Yeah. If you do that but have one day a week off, you're okay. If you give your liver a rest for one day, for that, so that would be about 36 hours in yeah. essence because you'd finish drinking. I was always told that your liver yeah. takes about four days to fully recover if you've been drinking heavily. Well, how many people give it four days? Well, 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 well some people do. Yeah, some well, people take off the whole so what, uh, what, month of January. What do you mean you don't drink during the week then? Well, I don't really drink during the week. I mean, yeah. I would drink at the weekends. When yeah. I, if, I'm, if I'm going out to meet somebody for lunch, I might have a yes. couple of glasses of wine. Yeah. Um, but if I don't go out and meet anybody for mm. lunch, which quite often is the case, yes. I, I, won't drink it. I, don't, I generally don't drink at home. So do you go out during... During that day? Not always, no. No? No. So you're a bit of a home bird, yeah? Yeah, well, because yeah. I sleep for a bit, then right. I make something to eat, eat yeah. something, uh, you yeah. know, do a bit of uh, admin, right. do whatever, um, yeah. watch a game of football maybe, whatever, if there's a game of football on, yeah. and I'll actually not leave the premises. Yeah, I see, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Bit of a sort of uh, claustrophobic Bit of a type, recluse. Uh, yeah, recluse. Well, I've become yeah. a bit of a recluse. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there was a time when I was always out. Yeah, sure. There was sure. a time when I'd sure. be out well, having lunch. that's a good thing. I'd be having dinner. It's a good thing. You know, I'd be doing all the things that you would accuse me of having, you know, an abandoned moral compass about. I think one of the great pleasures of life is at the end of a working day to go and have a quick pint, you know what I mean, and sit in the corner, have a look at the paper, something like that, or maybe do that on the way home or lunchtime or something like that, because I enjoy the social ambience of pubs, Well, right? I quite like them, but yeah. the problem is the end of my working yeah. day is 6 o'clock in the morning. Well, exactly. There's there's, the I mean, there, is, days, there yeah. are pubs you could go to, but, yeah, I, there wouldn't, are, yeah. but I wouldn't want to do that. On, yeah. on a, because, plus, I've got the car now. I bring the car into yeah, work, so exa- I exactly. I'm not going to go to the pub, am I? No, no exactly. No, of course not, no. Um, so, uh, so that's a situation. But I prefer to... Um, I prefer to rely on the report, which says that if you take one day off a week, then you keep yourself in pretty good shape if you're drinking, you know, three pints on the rest of the days. But the idea that you can have six pints a day and keep it going, that's the old-fashioned idea, Mike, that, oh, alcoholics only keep themselves alive by drinking their, you know, huge alcoholic amounts every day. It was always said of George mm. Best. Oh, George Best will go on forever. Till he stops drinking, then he'll drop dead. It's an old wives' tale. It's an old wives' tale. Have you, you ever been asked to kind of top up or, or, or uh, tot up, I should say, the number of units you have in a week? I like mean, you go to the doctors no. and they say, how yeah. much do you drink? What yeah. do you tell them? Oh, a couple of pints a day. Couple on of average. Pints a day. On average. Is that I right? Say. Is on that average. true? No. 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 So and why I do t- you tell them that then? I tell my heart doctors that I drink uh, only bitter shandy. Really? Yeah. Because that's good. Mm. You know, in the sense that I've And only... what do they say you should drink in terms of the amount? Oh, nothing. Well, they think you should do yeah, nothing yeah, at all. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's what. But they see, prefer. this is a bit that astonishes me about yeah. how you're actually still alive. Yeah, well, and me as well. As you've often mentioned, your mm. heart only works at a third of the rate of everybody else. No, no, else's. no, no. Only one third of my heart works, Mike. Well, so only one third of my then. heart. No, it's not. Well, it works at a third of a rate then. Surely. No, it, no, it doesn't. Only one third of it works. The other bits of it are knackered. Well, well, well surely it then works at a third see, of the rate. See, the problem with the heart is problem with the heart is problem. With my heart is that the bits of it that are knackered are dysfunctional, mm. but you can't replace them. Right. Uh, you can only replace a heart. Now, the I would love to... Well, the whole heart. Yeah, you've got to replace the whole heart. You can't replace bits of it. But if they replace the whole yeah. heart, would the two-thirds of it also then stop working because of some other reason? No, 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 no. It would all work again then. So you could have a whole new heart then? Yeah, yeah. If somebody gave me a new healthy heart, that'd be good. Well, why, didn't you, why did you not get, get that done then? Well, I took myself off the transplant list. Why? Because my life had been put on hold mm. and uh, I was going backwards. And, uh, you know, people were stealing bits of my life while I was um, confined to hospital right. and all this kind of stuff. So I had to get out and get back into it and mm. all that kind of stuff. Um, but the, the other thing is, I would love, I really would love to have um, that uh, heart disease where you can replace four um, veins and, and you're better again. What's mm. that called? I don't know. You know what it's called. You know, Bill well, Clinton's like bypass, 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 yeah. If you had a, you well, know, a bypass is not a disease. A bypass is a cure. By, bypass, uh, you're absolutely right, is blocked arteries, yeah. right? Go into hospital and what they do is they get a chainsaw and they cut you right down the sternum, OK? And then they get you all your ribs. Quite so graphic. No, 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 no. I'm telling you, they get all your ribs and they open them out, yeah. right, as though they're opening up a, a like a suitcase, I suppose, or something yeah. like that, you know. And then they take the veins out of the back of your thigh yeah. or your buttocks or something like that. Yeah. And they take the veins out of your heart, throw them away, put new veins in. Bang! You go from being incredibly knackered on day one mm. to as fit as a fiddle on day seven after yeah. you've had that operation. As now, long as I, it all works. Yeah, well, it's almost foolproof. It's almost foolproof. They've, 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 now, they've, they've got very advanced with all yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. Now, if I could have that operation, it'd be great, OK? Mm. Problem is, I can only have a whole heart or nothing. Yeah. That's the choice. Right. And it's a big choice, right? Yeah. And be- you have to wait for the right donor and all of that. I bet you didn't know this. One-sixth of people who go in for a heart transplant yeah. 
don't actually survive. No, I, I it's, wouldn't be it's, it's, it's not foolproof. That's what I'm saying. I mean, you can reject the heart, can't you? You can reject the heart. And when you hear these great stories, which you do, and I'm, I'm delighted it happens, you know, old, you know, Bill Bloggins has just finished his fourth New York marathon. You know, that would be great for a normal man. But for a man who had a heart transplant seven years ago, it's a miracle. That is one in a hundred, mm. honestly. Most people are not as able after a heart transplant as they were before their heart became diseased. No. Do you see what I mean? I see, I do. So, so it doesn't bring you back to full health. I mean, uh, I'll tell you who's had one very successfully, Eddie Large. How oh, has he? Remember Little and Large? Yeah, I do. Uh, and Eddie was the more flamboyant of the... Mm. Uh, of the uh, do you know? Now, before he had his, he literally... I remember him uh, telling us, because he, he came on, uh, on, on an afternoon show we do, um, that he couldn't actually pick up a towel and wipe his hair after getting out of the shower, just didn't have the bodily strength because right. his heart was so feeble. Mm. I think it's down to about 5% of use, you know? Yeah. Uh, mine's 33 and a third percent. And um, which I thought I'd remind you Thank about. you very much. For and, uh, and then afterwards, he, you know, he's, now he's, he's perfectly fine and all that. But it depends on what sort of life you've lived before the heart transplant mm. compared to the one you live after. Yes. Okay? Complicated stuff. So I'd let you know all this. Well, thank you very much for yeah, that. Yeah, well, you, I thought you, it was. Time to look into the light now. Uh, quick yeah. one from Bill. He says, uh, mm. the thyme has come for a supermarket sweep <laughs> involving <laughs> super porky parry. Yeah. Uh, hashtag Good idea. cosmic donut. Good uh, idea. Parry uh, philosophy is coming up very soon. It uh, certainly parry is. Parry philosophy is what we call after gods, and Parry wants to call this one after a mint, mm. uh, which he's not too impressed with. Andrew says, Why even not? though... Well, I don't think it's a great thing. It's not very cosmic, is it? I don't care if it's cosmic or not. It's practical. Yeah, well, it's not particularly practical. I don't even know if you can still it, get polos, it, it, can you? Yeah, of course you can. can it you? gives you a great image of what the planets look like, doesn't mm. it? Yeah, hey? but it doesn't look like a polo, I mean, really. Well, well, the rings around it do. Well, possibly. Yeah. Uh, but there's a big thing in the middle, though, which completely makes it look different. Andrew yeah. says, uh, even though some stuff is electronic, as long as it isn't on, it can be washed. Just mm. make sure it dries completely after. That is probably the worst tweet I've seen all night. That's right. a ridiculous idea. You can't wash electronic things. Yes, you can. No, you can't. You can wash a keyboard in a Rubbish. dishwasher. No. You can. Well, if anybody you wants to wash your try trainers. It, wash anybody, it. Well, trainers are not electronic. Those uh, are they, they? those wellies I gave you for Christmas, yeah. you can wash them in a, in a dishwasher. Well, I wouldn't need to wash them in a dishwasher. Why? Because you never use them? Well, no, I don't ever use them. Why? No, because Why? I don't like them. Because they're too I've garish. Already, I've already, yeah, they're too garish. Yeah, I've, already got, got, you've got I've no, already got wellies. You've got I've already got wellies. I've got no interest in wearing yours. You've got no blinking imagination. They don't imagination. fit very well either. You've got no imagination. Got, I'm not even sure they're both the same yeah, size. You haven't got an imagination. Now, here's one for you from a yeah. guy who doesn't give his name, but he says okay. he's a massive fan of the show. He says, as you two are fountains of knowledge, could you recommend yeah. a book for me to read that is both intriguing and knowledgeable? I'm 25 and I'm just looking to learn new things. Right. Maybe you could read your book about Wayne Rooney. Yeah, why not? Yeah. You get it for 99p. Yeah. Very, very cheap on uh, Amazon. What do you sell that for? Actually, well, you can well, get it for a penny. No, you can't. <laughs> you can buy no, you 100 can't. copies it's rubbish. of it. Uh, I would say that the best uh, novel I've ever read is The Pillars of the Earth. The Pillars of the Earth. Pillars of the Earth. Is, is, that, is that by, what's his name, that guy that you're always raving on yeah, about? Yeah, the guy who was married to the female Labour MP. Uh, you oh, know, Ken Follett. Ken Follett, yeah. yeah. It, it's a ter- terrific book because... It is actually such an illustrative and instructive book about life in the Middle Ages in this country. Really? It's all, honestly, it's, it's almost factual, but it's a great almost story. Almost factual. Yeah, it's a great story. So it's not yeah, a real yeah, story, yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Right. Now, what do you want to tell me about school reunions? Well, I don't want to tell you anything about school reunions, except for the fact I keep getting invited to one, right? Do you? Now, as you know, I went to the King's School Chester. Yes, so you keep saying. And if you Well, got... by the way you describe mm. it, you mm. are, by all uh, means, mm. by, by any manner mm. of means, mm. their most famous uh, uh, former old boy. Well, I didn't say that, but when you walk walk into the foyer or the entrance hall of the King School Chester, yeah. which is very imposing, yeah. very imposing building, uh-huh. and look to your right, yeah. there is a picture of me. Um, Why? What are you laughing at? Why is there a picture of you Because there? I am one of their most distinguished ex-pupils. Well, and, it can't be much and, of a school, can it? And, and, well, you if see, you're the most you see, distinguished see that's, ex-pupil. See, that's nonsense. See how many people I sent to Oxbridge each year? Well, you've told me At least 14. Before. At least 14. So what? Well, that's, uh, it's a mark of a, of well, a very good one, school. Well, why haven't they got those 14 people's pictures up instead of yours? Because they didn't sort of make their mark in life like I did. I see. In the public eye. Did anybody else go there that made their mark in life that I would know? Yeah. Um, there was somebody. Uh, he, years ago, there was, a, there was a comedy series, which even I can't remember because it was so far back, called mm. Hugh and Terry. And it was Terry Scott and, yeah. and a little fellow called Hugh Lloyd. Oh, I remember him, yeah. Hugh Lloyd. Yeah, skinny guy. Yeah, he, he went to the King's School like Chester. Laurel. That's right, absolutely he? right. You went to the King's School Chester, mm. yeah. Uh, now, the point is... Have they got a picture of him up there as well? Uh, I believe they have. 
I believe that. I mean, I've never been there, so I don't know. What do you mean you've never been there? Well, I've never seen you this You go picture. on and on about this yeah, school, no, yeah, right? And you've yeah. never been back once. Well, I, I'm i waiting to get invited back to the prize giving at the end of the year when I can give them all a lecture about getting into broadcasting or journalism or something oh, yeah. like that, which Have I'd like to do. Have they never asked you? No, but I'm going to... that, isn't it? Well, I'm going to invite Considering myself. they've got a picture no, of no, you I'm, as you walk in. I'm so fed up with that, I'm going to invite myself. Mm. I'm going to write to the... I keep, I keep meaning to write to the careers master and say, why haven't you invited me? Because I could uh, help your boys on their path through life, yeah. which starts Apparently here. Apparently Patrick Mercer went there. Patrick Mercer, the MP? Yeah, That's former right, MP. he did, he did. He was a friend of the Duke of Westminster, actually. He's, step, he's stepping down, isn't yeah. he? Duke of Westminster. He got involved in a there. bit of a... Um, um, a bit of a sort of uh, yeah. sting operation. Now, now, what I was going to say to you Martin was... Martin Lewis, the money-saving expert, also he did. went there. He did, he did, he did. Martin Lewis went there. Any That's of us, these people right. uh, contemporaries of yours? Well, I know Martin very well. We've done shows with him, you know, and I didn't realise the first time I did a show with him, he went to the same school yeah. as me. Martin ended up making 87 million quid... Did he? ...when he sold his uh, website, you know, uh, what's it called? Moneysavingexpert.com. Uh, m- m- something like that, yeah, well done, and, and that's a brilliant, brilliant uh, thing to have done. Um, I haven't yet made 87 million. So is there quid. a picture of him when you go into the foyer as well, then? Well, I don't know, because I haven't been there, you see. Well, why would they have a picture of you and not one of him? Well, I don't know, but people keep bringing me up and saying, oh, I was at the King's Hall Chester parents' night last night. There's a picture of you there, Mike. You know, it's, your big, it's the biggest picture. You're right in the centre of the Hall of Fame. I say, oh, that's Dude, great. Me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm amazed that you haven't been there to go and preen um, in front of it. Well, actually, I did you go there when I, went to try, when I went to try and save Chester about yeah. f- five years ago. Oh, yeah, how did that go? Uh, unfortunately failed. They got relegated on the day we took the coach, you know, uh, and, and it, it had a flag on the front which said uh, Porky Parry's Blue and White Army. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but there's only 12 people on the coach. Only 12 people turned up. <laughs> it's quite yeah. a small army. Yeah, it was quite Not a small army. Not even a division, army. really. No, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. So, anyway, I took some people from TalkSport round to the old King School Chester, quite yeah. proud of showing them my antecedents. Uh-huh. But, of course, it was closed. It was a Saturday. Oh, right. So we could only peer in through the wind, you know, through the doors. Couldn't see the picture from Couldn't there. Couldn't see the picture from there, right. no. But, um, you know, a friend of mine who's children Children go there, keeps ringing me up and telling me it's there. Uh, Michael Owen's children go there. Oh, yeah? Um, so it is a prestigious school. Now, what I was going to say is, so you go to these... Are you sure you should have said that on national radio? I think it's quite well known, to be honest. Is it? Yeah. All right. And if it's not, I'll withdraw it. OK. <laughs> it's too late now to withdraw it. But, yeah, yeah. But, but uh, no, what I was going to say is, I am certain that some of the people I went to school with mm. have excelled in life yeah. on a much bigger scale than me, but they're not in a job that has a public uh, image. Not very high mean? profile. Not very high profile. For instance, at least 12 of my colleagues went to Cambridge or Oxford... Mm and to other distinguished universities to study things like medicine, accountancy, and I'm certain, they, you know, some of them will have gone into the city and made millions. Mm. I'm certain that some of them will have risen to the very highest levels of, of, of the, the well, medical profession. you can probably profession. look up their Wikipedia page and find out. Well, you, you're, probably, you really you're, pro- you're probably good. Well, have you, when have you been invited to this school reunion? Now? Well, I get invited about every couple of years. Right. And do I, they do it every year? Because some of them only do yeah. it like a 10-year anniversary or a 20-year anniversary, or this I'm would be, not... in your case, what, a 30 or 50-year anniversary or something? No. 40-year anniversary? No, no, no. It would be... It would be uh, about a 30, about a 30, 35. 30. 30 or 35. Right. But, but anyway, look, look, the point of the story is this, right? One, you were quite a late one, uh, developer then, were you? No, 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 no. One chap who uh, who was a school colleague, right? And in fact, he was my medical advisor when I fought for the heavyweight championship of the school. It oh, was yeah. in my corner, yeah. I won it, by the way. Beat a bloke who was six foot two inches tall. And, yes, um, you told us that story. Yes, exactly. I'm still waiting to see the evidence of that. No, as no, well. no, no, that happened. Um, he went into medicine, mm. went to Cambridge University, but was sponsored by the British Army. Was it? Yeah. So he was going to come out of Cambridge and then join the army mm. as a medic, right? Yeah, I went to university with a few people like that. Did you? Yeah, yeah. and and quite a high place medic. Now, Mostly they were in the navy. Yeah, oh, really? Right. Yeah. Now, but this boy was so bright, and he had a very he had a very normal name like Jones. His name was Jones. Why, would that, why would that be strange? Well, because, he, you know, he had a, it was... You're a, suggesting people with a normal name aren't very bright. No, no, I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm just saying that it's easy to remember because it was Jones, you know what I mean? And I always said to myself, he was so bright. I mean, he, he got straight A's at A level and I bet he got a first-class honours degree at Cambridge and all that, that I would have expected him by now to be probably retired, but head of the British Army Medical um, Service. Without a shadow of a doubt, I'm sure he'd have got there. Very possible. There were other people there who, who had... Uh... But why are you not in touch with any of these people, though? Well, because 
I don't think there's any point. Why would you be in? Why would you want to be in touch with somebody you last saw thirty five years ago? Well, you might be interested in seeing what sort of life they had, or no, talking about uh, I, the sort my, of time, I tell you what the happens, good times that you had when you were at school. These reunions happen at the, the, the um, Grosvenor Hotel in Chester, five star hotel in the northwest of England, top hotel owned by the Duke of Westminster, all that kind of stuff, right? Mm. And all that happens at reunions. Snob alert. No, no, just thought I'd let you know. All uh, well, listen. In my class at school, this is why I like direct grand grammar schools. There was a son of a bus driver. There was a fireman's son. There was a guy who was a, a chauffeur, you know, yeah. for, fully enough, for, uh, like, uh, the landed gentry around mm. Cheshire and all that kind of stuff. But they got the opportunity to go to a very good school because it was a direct grant. Now, what I'm saying is, when you go to these reunions, all it is is boast fest. Well, you haven't been um, to one. I know. That's so how do you know what it's like? Because I know, I know, I know. So how do you possibly know what it's like if I, you haven't been to one? I've been told about it by people who did go. Well, you don't know um, any of them. Well, I've got my spies around. Have you? And, um, this is a very bizarre, and, bizarre and, story, this. And they walk into these dinners and then they go on about what sort of car they've got, what sort of house they've got, mm. how much money they've made, uh, how wealthy they are, how successful they've been. I can't be bothered getting into all of that. You'd love that. <laughs> no, you I would absolutely no, love no, it. No, you talk about your Jaguar. No. You talk about your Mercedes. You talk about your penthouse. Yeah, but it what... would be absolutely fitting for you down to a T. I about... can't imagine why you wouldn't go every week. Hang on. What about if some bloke on the side of the table said, "Oh, well, actually, I live in Monaco. I've got a yacht." Yeah, it's this why you're not uh, going. Uh, See, the real no, reason no, you won't no, go no, is because no, you're worried that somebody might be more successful than you. No, there might be more of a no. boastful person than no, you. No, no, no. Would make you look a bit small. I have no. That's what you're worried about. I have no envy against those who succeed in life. As long they're not in the same room as you. What? I have none whatsoever. None whatsoever. And uh, I wish that everybody could succeed in life. Everybody should have a yacht. Yeah. And then the world would be a Well, I had a school reunion well, story for you, but we're out of time now. Well, come on, tell me about no, it. No, we haven't got any time because you've well, spent all you the time why talking you about me? yourself, as usual. No, no, you should have told usual. me. As usual. You should have told me. And, and, do you know what? I walked into the lifeboat station in Minehead in Somerset once, right? What are you and talking about there now? Was, there was a picture on the wall of uh, a guy called Dr John Higgy, uh-huh. and he wasn't the guy who went into the Navy, into the army. What are you talking about? He became a doctor. He was in my class at school. And he, he, was, he was his up... name was Jones. No, no, he was the other guy. This was Dr John Higgy, and he was a lifeboat man in my I don't care. I don't a care. I could not How care about less. That? What a coincidence. I couldn't care less. What a coincidence. I couldn't care less. He's a porky parry. Coming up next, uh, we're supposed to be doing the porky philosophy, uh, so we'll see if I can get a word in uh, in that section of the show. This is Talk Sport. Every time uh, at this stage of the week, he's going to offer the benefit of his advice uh, in what is being called parry Uh Mr Parry, uh, you're going to give me three pieces of advice which mm. I'm going to attempt to explain mm. to everybody else or mm. to interpret mm. in some way, shape or form. I know you've been practising your technique and your kind no, of... No, uh, no, 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 no. I, uh, want to, I want to, at this juncture, I want to refer to our audience as my children. OK. Because I feel that I am being a father, in the sense that I feel I have wisdom to impart. Mm. Now, all jokes aside, I am a man who meditates. I meditate on the issues in life which I feel can improve people's lives. We are here on Earth to help others. Mm. We are not here to help ourselves. I will put some points to you, Michael. Yes. And I would like you to react and tell me how you interpret them. My first point is that God gave us one mouth but two ears. Therefore, why do you not listen more than you speak? Well, that's a very, very good piece of advice. And in fact, um, I'm going to try and um, practice that uh, uh, rather than preaching the complete opposite because unfortunately my problem in life is that I work with someone um, who doesn't practice that. And he has one mouth and two ears, but he doesn't actually use his ears to listen to anything that I say. And you are throwing that insult back at me? Careful, careful. You're, you're in meditation mode here. You are throwing that insult back at I'm me? I'm saying that I have to deal with somebody who doesn't listen you and are, who only speaks. You are suggesting that I have two mouths and one ear. Yes, I, I am, actually. You are suggesting that. Yes, so why that's don't, what it feels like. Why don't you say that? Well, that wasn't how I thought of it, but now that you've said that, I can see what you mean. So why don't you say that? You do have two mouths and one ear. So I see. The insult is complete. Let me give you another piece of philosophy. Yes. Which I want you to think about and respond to, please. A bird does not sing because it has an answer. A bird sings 
because. <laughs> Go on. Excuse me. How, Sorry. How do you expect me to to deliver this? Sorry, philosophy. Harry. A bird doesn't sing because it has an answer. A bird sings because it has a song. Now I like that. Now that I like. A bird sings because it can. In other words. Which is a very, very true thing to say. Some people don't because sing. it has a song. Some people don't sing um, because they have no song to sing. I suppose. Yes. And what you're suggesting is that they should find a song to sing. I'm saying that he or she who does not have a song should not sing. Oh right. So if you don't have a song, what are you supposed to do then? If you don't have a song, do not sing. Hmm. If you do sing, do not sing because you think you have the answer. Sing because you have the song. OK, I think I'm slightly confused by this one, but I should also point out once again that the person I work with sings an awful lot and doesn't necessarily sing because he has a song. You, he you, sings because he sings somebody else's song. You cannot throw every philosophical point I put to you back into my face as an insult. That is not the purpose. I'm just struggling to understand how to interpret me, it. Of me trying to help the children. OK. OK? All right. There Let's try children. the next one. There are children. Third one I wish to put to you is be sure to taste your words before you spit them out because you cannot put them back in your mouth. Taste your words before you spit them out. It sounds like good, uh, uh, a good sort of advice as well. Mm. So you shouldn't say anything without first thinking what your effect of your, what you're going to say is going to be on anybody else. Quite simple. Be sure to taste your words before you spit them out because you cannot put them back in your mouth. What if they taste bad? The philosophy here is you must look before you leap but in a metaphorical, oral sense. Mm. Well, I think all of those pieces of advice are very good. I'm sure they'll be helpful to an awful lot of people. And I can only hope um, that once this particular segment of the show is over, mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that everyone will practice these fine words of wisdom. I want our children to take these very, very seriously. Mm. They may feel that they can mock and deride and point to me as a figure of fun. But we're all on life to help others. That is my mission in Don't life. Don't forget you have to keep your voice down at this point. That is my mission in life. That is my mission in life. Well, I hope, if uh, all joking aside, that, that with this philosophy, what you'll be able to impart not only to the rest of the listening world, but also uh, within this studio, mm. is a much more kind of um, calm atmosphere, a place where people can say what they feel uh, and a place where people can sing whatever song they want. Calm is what it is all about. I call it Mill Pondery. Mill Pondery. That's the uh, Parilosophy uh, for this week. Uh, there'll be some more Parilosophy same time next week. Uh, meanwhile, think about Mill Pondery uh, and taste your words before you sing. Uh, and don't forget to listen with both your mouths. This is Talk Sport. Talking Perry out of his uh, Parilosophy trance and back to normal. So uh, uh, what I was going to tell you about was the high yeah. school reunion that I went to. Yeah, go on, uh, tell which me. Which was not one of my own, because I wouldn't ever dream of going to mm. one of those things either. I'm mm. like you. Not because I'm worried that somebody's going to have more success than me, mm. but I was dragged to one by my ex-wife in right. uh, when we lived in New York. Yeah. And she went to school in Connecticut, and I had to go up there. And I actually wasn't feeling particularly well. I think mm. I had a cold or something, a bit of flu was this, uh, this was when your ex-wife wasn't standing on the touchline of a football field shouting abuse at you no. across the field. No, that was after we moved back right. to England. Okay, yeah. Well, that was after we split up, to yeah, be fair. Exactly, you know, yeah. She wasn't always yeah. like that. But yeah. uh, this was when mm. uh, she wanted to go back to this little town in, uh, in Connecticut yeah. uh, where she was brought up, where she went to the local high school, yeah. and where most, mostly, I'd say, what, 95% of the people never left the town. Right. They never went anywhere. Was this Westbury? Um, it was a place called Brookfield, oh, right, outside Brookfield. of Danbury. Oh, oh Danbury. I know Danbury, Danbury, yeah. Mm. And uh, it was kind of commuter. It was, it was just out, in mm. those days, it was just outside sort of mm. commuter belt for New York. Mm. But we were living in New York, you know, mm. young, successful couple. I was working as a, you know... 
dangerous international journalist mm. in the mm. world of uh, you know traveling around the, the country yeah. going in, going on planes all the time she was working on wall street i think yeah and we went and it was exactly as you describe it she mm. just was spending the entire time boasting about our lifestyle and how we used to go to puerto rico for weekends and how yeah. much money we had and all yeah. that kind of stuff and i was i thought it was absolutely horrendous i just literally sat in a corner and drank jack daniels all night and refused to speak to anybody what were the other people like they were all working in various places in and around Danbury. You know, like there would be one guy who was working in a real estate office, another yeah. guy working in a car dealership, somebody else. Another guy had a... run the local uh, store or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it was literally like that. Truck and they, driver. And, and there was nobody yeah. there who had actually left the town. Yeah. So, and, they were, and they were all... So um, what was the reaction from the other people? Did they think she was a loud mouth who'd come back to um, boast about... I think about... by the end of it, they probably did, yeah. because it probably yeah. got a bit sickening having to listen to it all. Exactly. You know, where exactly. she was talking about having been moved to London course, and spent time in England and all that, just our listeners know yeah. you were actually a very fortunate young man in those days because yeah. you hit on a, a good idea to set up a um, a freelance news agency in New York. I did. Bas- basically because nobody would employ you. Um, not true. So, no. So, so no, no, it was a good initiative. Actually, I'm not no, one, it. Of, one of the main reasons. It. One of the main yeah. reasons I went to, mm. to, to to America was because yeah. I wanted to get back together with her. We, she and I had split up. Yeah. And I couldn't work out how to go to America. I couldn't get anyone to send me there. Mm. So I thought, well, the best thing to do is I just go on my own. Yeah. And I was only 23. Exactly. I had nothing to lose. I literally went with a hundred dollars in my pocket. Yes. And you know the rest is history. Exactly. Where did you live when you first went? Well, when we first when I first went over there, she was living in Queens. Right. Um, at the end of the number seven line. Not in a good Flushing, place to out live. Out by Shea Stadium, and I yeah. got out there and I thought, this is not where I'm going to live. No. moved to Manhattan. Exactly. I haven't moved to Queens. Mm. So I got myself my first apartment, actually, yeah. which I went to revisit last time I was there. Right. On East 26th Street. Between, East 26, yeah. Uh, between Lex and 3rd. Between Lex and 3rd, yeah. Which yeah. was great in many ways. Unfortunately, what it's it very trendy out, now. It's very trendy now. Mm. It wasn't quite mm. so trendy then. There was a lot of hookers around in those days. Who used to, yeah. you know, I got to know them all quite well because I'd be walking over sure past them did. every night. Yeah. Not because of the reason yeah, you yeah. think. Yeah. Uh, but they'd, they'd call me by, you know, used to say, hi, Mike, how are you? All that kind of thing. They yeah. knew I wasn't interested in that. Mm. But also, rather unfortunately, it was near one of the big union headquarters. And, oh, uh, yeah. So there were trucks that would park outside all night. Guys would sleep in their truck really? outside my window ah. and, and with their engines running. What floor was your flat on? Uh, I think it was the second. Right, so I wasn't so, very high up. No, it was only I a see, brownstone. Yeah. Yeah, I no, see, I got yeah. great memories of those times. It was wonderful. Yeah, okay. Well, you did very well out there, but um, no, you're absolutely right. Unfortunately, excuse me, your world crashed to the uh, earth a few years later. But then that happens to us no, all. No, it didn't. Yes, of course it did. No, it didn't. I went from strength to strength. No, no, you came back to this country. You were penniless, jobless. I rescued you on all scores, and uh, <laughs> and without if only me, it were true. without me, you'd now be f- floating around uh, face down in the River Thames. Well, that's as maybe. Yeah, I suspect yeah. that wouldn't be the case. No, now, I, see, I, I know it'd be the case. Now, I'm going to read you a few tweets <laughs> right, that we've got on, yeah. from people on your uh, parry-losophy. Yeah. Ali says, uh, be sure to taste your words before you speak. Uh, I think Porky is tripping. And uh, Ian says, Mystic Meg. Mm. And uh, here's another one from uh, uh, Tony who says, Loving Guru Porky, talking cobblers as usual. What? Um, And uh, Ian in Rossendale says, I can't get the image of Porky in a turban out of my head. Mm. Well, listen, when I called our listeners the children, this is what I... I do feel I have a role in life. I mean, quite seriously, I have a role in life to impart the wisdom that I've gathered throughout my own life to other people, right? And, and, And these philosophical statements are really a dressed up way of saying look I know because I've been there and done this and done that and you should do this that's that's what I mean yeah. that's what I mean but it's, it's, it's quite... not Confucius says mm. Confucius says right was Confucius. just a load yeah just a load of mumbo jumbo from like hundreds of centuries ago have you read any of other great philosophers though uh, I don't like have Descartes, to Descartes no perhaps. no I don't have to Rousseau uh, no no what always amazed Hobbes. me no, no 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 what always amazed why not because I don't need to what? Because I'm not stealing somebody but, else's ideas. Well, you're not stealing ideas. The whole point yes, of philosophy is to discuss ideas and no, think about ideas. I've got my own philosophy. For instance, you know, I was always amazed when I read that John Lennon sort of shacked up in the Dakota for a couple of years and did nothing but read the works of Young. Mm. Now, you know, the only young I know is Alex Young, who played centre forward for Everton in right. the 60s. Well, I think I John Lennon perhaps I expanded his mind slightly more than you have. I don't care who, who about the. He's a German, wasn't he? He young? was. Yeah. A, a German philosopher. I mean, what, what is a philosopher? What can philosophers tell you? Philosophers can tell you about the meaning of life. No, no, no. no. Philosophers can tell you about what they think is the meaning of no, life. No, they can't. But I don't care what Young thinks no, about the see, meaning of the life. Exact opposite I don't of care what some guy in Germany thinks about, you know, walking around the Black Forest and drinking um, Steiners of. Uh, of uh, ale and beer and all that. I don't think that. that's what he talks about. Well, I don't know what he talks about because I'm not going to read him. Well, I don't, don't want to know. Well, if you did read it, and I, I don't know why, why you're telling me you, you become so it? shrill. Well, no. because it's thought-provoking. It's not thought-provoking. And it's supposed to expand your horizons. OK, I 
OK. Well, you I know t- about, uh, all you yeah. know about is your own little world. So does that make Hitler a philosopher? No, because it he, Because he wrote a book called Mein Kampf. No, it doesn't. Which is translated as My Philosophy or something, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. No, it doesn't. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, you know, somebody writes a book about the way their mind works and what they think about the world, and that makes them a philosopher. I don't think so. Not necessarily, I do no. not think so. But there are certain people who are regarded as great philosophers because they were great thinkers of their time, because at the time, when they came out with some of the thoughts that they had, nobody else yeah. had really thought about them. All right, well, would you say... some would of you the classical say, philosophers. Would you say Russell Brand is a great philosopher? Um, I would say uh, he probably thinks he's a bit of a philosopher. I don't particularly like his philosophy, I th- so I, I think he t- no. I think he talks absolute nonsense, yeah. you know, he talk, and he talks it from a perspective of complete hypocrisy. Yeah. So why would you take any notice of him? Yeah. Why would you take notice of him? Well, he's not the kind and, of person and, I'm talking about, really. Well, who are you talking about, then? Go I'm on, describe about, your favourite well, philosopher well, to me. My favourite philosopher, probably... Um, I would say was uh, was a novelist actually Jean Paul Sartre who wrote The Roads to Freedom, uh, who was an existentialist who basically talked about how the meaning of life was essentially meaningless. And I, it didn't I, actually I know all about ex- existentialism. Yeah. I've studied existentialism. Okay. Well, what, what did you make of it? Existentialism is basically a man goes along a road and comes in life and goes to and comes to a crossroads. If he takes the right road off that crossroads, mm. he then comes to another crossroads. If he takes the right road off that crossroad, he comes to another crossroad. Yeah. And if he eventually arrives where, you know, he'd like he's to be... He's going to be very tired by the where end of he like, trip, Where he? he'd like to be, it means he's taken the right turning at each crossroad. Those of us who fall by the wayside have taken the wrong turnings at one or more of those crossroads and end up in the gutter where we probably belong because we don't have the sustenance, the ability, the wit and the, and the sheer willpower... To press on in life. I don't think that's it's as simple all. as that. No, it's as simple as that. that Philosophy is a load of baloney. I don't think it even exists. Philosophy is just one man's idea of how he thinks the life works. Well, philosophy, oh, by the way, philosophy doesn't exist. But if you had actually gone to university yeah. in a decent university and studied philosophy, you would have found out a little bit more about yourself. You would have found out a little bit more about the world around you. About how I know thoughts, all about myself. About thoughts, how thoughts I know all about you. myself. Do you? Yeah. Yeah, but the truth about what you. What more do I need to know about myself? Well, the truth about you is that you don't like yourself. Oh, rubbish. You don't. Who actually, told you that? Deep down, I can tell. Oh, what a I can nonsense. Tell. Well, do you like yourself? Yeah, I do. Well, when I'm you look happy. in the mirror, do you like yourself? I'm very happy in my happy skin. Happy with your body image? I'm very happy in my skin. It's not about my body image. Like being a fat uh, blob. See, yeah, I can tell when you're turning nasty. No, on no, no, no. Well, that's what you are. You say I'm not happy with myself. I don't think you are. That is completely untrue. That's why you choose to surround yourself nope. with all kinds of uh, baubles and nope. gadgets and expensive baubles, things. Baubles, gadgets. I am very and, and, happy and, and, with myself, yeah, right? But, but you, you surround yourself with all these kind of trappings of life. I'm happy to give away to other people who are less fortunate than me. I don't have a problem with that. By the way, did you see that chap on the train the other day? He gave a woman five pounds and a little note which said, um, well done for being a, a very good mother to your child. A oh, very really? polite little no, child. I didn't five... see that. And, and... This wasn't the guy that was doing good deeds all over the place, was no, it? No, no, it was just a one-off. Everybody had a huge fuss of it saying, it was a... blimey, I've been in restaurants mm. where I've seen... Uh, I think there were 12 of them, 12 students from yeah. Portsmouth University who were all having a night out. and in, it, was in a, it, was in a, it was in Pizza Express, actually. Yeah. And I thought, what nice young people, they're the future of us and all that kind of stuff. So after I'd finished on the way out, I said, give me their bill. And I paid it for them right. um, because I wanted to, you know, just register the fact that, you know, it's great to be young. Well, that's and showing off, and, isn't and, it? No, it's no, I didn't tell them. I didn't tell them. I didn't tell them. And I just said, tell them I paid a bill and, and I left. Um, now, I got about... 300 yards down the road, yeah. this was in Gunwolf Keys in uh, Portsmouth, and then I heard this click, 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 and two of the girls who had been on the table came running after me yeah. and said, we can't believe what you've done. It's so kind of you. Thank you very much indeed. It's... I said, don't worry about it. I said, I'm very, very lucky. I said, uh, you know, I've got more money than you and I'm very happy to share my good fortune and uh, I hope you had a good night and all that kind of stuff. They said, oh, you're an amazing man, amazing. And, uh, and that's why and you did it, isn't it? No, no, so well, that somebody would tell you you're an amazing well, man because about the only chance on. you're ever going to get of somebody doing that. Hang on. Why then did I do it anonymously? Why did I disappear? Why did I not no, hang you around? You didn't disappear. I did disappear. I had no. In- I, I said to the waiter, I said, don't tell him. I said, I said, just tell him it's paid for yeah. from a benefactor and all that. But one of the girls must have seen me leaving or she must have yeah. noticed me Funny while that, I was in the it? restaurant or how, something like that. How strange. Oh, how on. bizarre. Hang on. Or, or, or she must have. Um, she must have uh, said to the... Uh, she must have fluttered her eyelashes at the head waiter and said, well, where did this come from? Uh, anyway, you know... Well, they found out very quickly after you'd well, done it. Well, the uh, young people, they were astute. They're students, you mm. know. We pay a lot of money to educate our students really? and clearly they knew what they were doing. But I mean, what I'm saying is the philosophy thing, it just drives me mad. Uh, you know, when people describe themselves as philosophers or, or, or 
somebody else describes them as a philosopher, it's nonsense. It's a rubbish, garbage. There's no such thing as a philosopher. There's a thing about people who talk junk in their own mind. Mm. I mean, was John Lennon a philosopher? I think he was a bit of a philosopher, yeah. I think he was a philosopher. Yeah. But I, he wasn't a philosopher because he wanted to influence the way the world worked or anything like that. Well, he did, actually. He wanted us all to... I mean, he kept but saying... But you just said you don't believe in philosophy. Uh, uh, what I'm saying is this... I don't believe in people describe themselves as philosophers, but I can always look at what John Lennon's writings are all about. John Lennon used to say things like, if everybody concentrated on buying themselves a new television when they wanted a television, there wouldn't be any wars. Mm. Now, that is philosophy. Oh, yeah, it's not a particularly expensive philosophy. He, but, also, uh, he also said... But the point about John Lennon is he, that he also yeah. believed in reading and broadening his mind, which you clearly don't believe in, I, I, because you think you know everything. I find which it boring. Is, which... I find it boring reading other people's opinions. Really? I find it boring. Why do I want to... You find it boring it? listening to anybody else's uh, opinions as well. Maybe sometimes I do. You do? You're not going to find me sitting in a hall, mate, listening to some philosopher rabbit on about, you know, the meaning of life, because I know about the meaning of life. What is the meaning of life? The meaning of life is um, make the most of what it is while it's there, yeah. when you can, and share, share your good fortune with those around you, mm. absorb your bad fortune, and protect those around you, OK? Oh, yeah. And John Lennon also said, and this is a brilliant, brilliant quote, life is what happens when you're busy getting on with other things. When you're busy uh, making other plans, actually, is the line. Busy doing other things, right? And that could be applied to my penthouse. See, perhaps I didn't take enough notice of the old roof terrace. Yeah. Perhaps I didn't take enough notice of the old shower room and all that. You see what I mean? Mm. And it means while I was busy doing other things, like, for instance, organising... Showing off. Excuse me, organising our show in Birmingham, mm. which incidentally there are only eighteen seats left in is that our right? auditorium. Yeah, Blimey. yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Isn't so it? obviously we're going to a very big auditorium as big well. Big auditorium, three hundred people there, March and uh, we'd love to see you. it's March of six. Yeah, get onto the ticket line, folks, because we'd love to see you there. So what, what I'm saying is, when I'm organising that, yeah. when I'm putting into place plans for the next show that you and I do, yes. I'm not saying that you don't make a contribution, Mike. I'm just saying that. <laughs> I... What, what, that what, is exactly what, what you're saying. Isn't no, it? no, I'm, uh, you actually uh, resent uh, the fact. You what? resent the fact what? that because I'm more talented than you. More that talented. Technically speaking, more talented. I don't, I don't have to what do. What a laugh! I don't more have to talented. do. I don't have hey. to do all the donkey work. You more see. talented. As my oh, father oh. used to say, "There's no uh, point in having uh, a, a dog and barking yourself." Oh, is that what you think? No. Oh, is that what you think? Right? That's, no, that's what my father used to well, say. Well, tell you what, we'll put it to the audience now, mm. right? Put what to the audience? We'll put this to the audience. What happened to this very calm, we'll put this to the audience thing. You see, it's, it's, it's literally it, exploded in your face. We will put this to the audience, right? You've got if, one mouth and two ears, if right? You could, you remember that. If you could choose, if you could choose to have one of us, yeah, one snob, of us only, one of us only, Mike Parry. you know, uh, giving you the lowdown on what life's all about and how to uh, face it and conquer it and all that, would you prefer to hear from... Uh, the man I call El Fatso sometimes <laughs> when I'm quite annoyed with him. That's, uh, that's old Mike Graham. Or would you prefer to hear from the portmeister? Yeah. I think the answer's pretty obvious. Here's one from Mark. He says, the way Porky rambles on, it's more like four mouths and no ears, the fourth being in his backside where he talks from mostly. <laughs> I think that's very good. That is very nice. Uh, I, I try and impart Timmy wisdom. Says, I try and impart wisdom to, our, to, to the people I call my children when mm. I'm in that mood, and that's the response I get, eh? Here's one from Trucker Timmy. He says, Porky, you can also go straight on at a crossroads. You don't have to make any turnings at all. Well, yes, but you so take you make a, you make a choice on your direction from those mm. crossroads, don't you? That's the point. Yeah, that's the point which a lot of people miss. You see, and here's one from people Mike. don't understand existentialism like I do. I, I virtually invented existentialism. Did you? Yeah, existentialism. Existentialism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I forgot the eye. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, actually, Mike yeah. says this: Parry should mm. practice what he preaches before he mm. tells all the listeners that if they go to a state school, they're thick. You see, I didn't upset, say that. I never upset, said that. You've upset lots of people I never over said the that. course of the last You put words into my mouth. I never said that at all. What no. I said was I want people who go to a state school to have the opportunity to better themselves. Mm. You only do that by getting a better education system. Now, okay? before uh, we, uh, we close this particular chapter of mm. the two mics, there will be another one tomorrow night, of course, at 2 o'clock yep. after the Spurs game, uh, will. which hopefully will be as good as the Chelsea-Liverpool game, mm -hmm. but we don't know. Yep. Uh, it's been delightful to see you again, but I just want to remind you and a podcast. that uh, uh, there will be a podcast out. 80 mile an hour's uh, uh, rule is coming back yeah. in. It's made Hope a so. comeback. Hope so. So you can, go, um, you can go hopefully soon down the motorway at 80 miles an hour. Hope so. Which is what I mean, you want to do. I do already, and I say that without fear or favour. Well, as long as you don't put the headphones in. No, uh, I already go at least 80 miles an hour, sometimes. 85 because mm. my car was built to do 100 miles an hour. Yeah. Whereas when the 70 mile an hour rule was in place, mm. that was built for Morris Miners. It's not a good idea to admit to breaking the law. Well, I'm not admitting to breaking the law. Well, I'm, you just have. It's virtual. Virtual speed. Virtual. Virtual speed. Um, well, and pretending you're a Spitfire pilot while doing the same thing. Okay, I said that. 
lots of people do that. I lots don't think there's anything wrong with that. Lots of, I but you say, shouldn't I, admit to speeding, though. No, no, well, I'm not admitting to speeding. You get a 10% allowance on the 70 miles an hour, so that uh-huh. takes it already to 77, OK? Right. So I'm only talking about 7 miles an hour right. uh, or 3 miles an hour at 80 miles an hour. I'm only talking about 3 <laughs> miles an hour over the speed limit, aren't I? Yeah, and right? also you can argue, if you get a really good lawyer, that uh, mm. the calibration of your speedometer might not be entirely No, I wouldn't correct. argue that. I'd argue that this car is very safe. It's got a good braking system, mm. much better than a Morris Minor. Mm. The, the, the 70 miles an hour was built for a Morris Minor, which was basically a tin of Heinz baked beans on wheels. It's no wonder that they uh, only went at seven miles an hour. They used to fall to pieces at 60 miles an hour. Anyway, have you ever seen a, a Morris Minor on the on the hard shoulder of a motorway with the wheel broken and, and fallen off? Not for about 50 years. No, well, I have as well. I'm back at seven o'clock with Mr Brazil. Are you? Mm. Blimey, well, you better go and have a lie down. Okay. Um, no, uh, no racing around. In a dark no, room. Uh, go and eat with one of those mouths that you've got and uh, keep yourself uh, very, very fit. Follow us at the two mics, uh, at Mike Parry 8, at IROMG as well. And uh, do let us know what you think. And uh, if you think uh, that uh, uh, those last 18 tickets up in Birmingham uh, might be your last chance to see us, don't worry, there will be other shows and we will be announcing something else, perhaps before the end of this week. This is Talk Sport. We are the two mics. Look at the light! Don't forget to follow the two mics at the two mics on Twitter and on YouTube. Just look for Two Mics TV. Do you know what you can do with dishwashers? What? Well, you can put your keyboard in from your computer. Why would you do that? Uh, clean it thoroughly, because it doesn't get cleaned anywhere else. No, that's an electronic, way, it's a piece of electronic equipment. You can't yeah, get it wet. No, there is no electronic stuff in a keyboard. It's just a physical thing. It's like a wind-up clock. 